Good afternoon and welcome to one and all present here. I, architect Nikita Devineni, take this opportunity to welcome the dignitaries, participants from institutions at Pan India level for day three of this five day EFDP on sustainable development through building design, past and future. Organized by School of Architecture, Dhanan Sagar Academy of Technology and Management, Campus 2, in collaboration with COA TRC Bhopal. Today we have Professor and Colonel Virendra Kumar Malik as our day three session one speaker. Professor is an alumni of SPA, IIT, MIT, and IMA with three decades of rich experience of working in different environments to include various ministries of government of India, military engineering services and combat engineers on various appointments with proven capacity to lead and excel in the mission oriented roles of infrastructure development projects, imparting the experience gained in fostering excellence and innovation in teaching structures and building construction to students with philosophy of experiential learning by encouraging new avenues of thinking within the teaching disciplines, gaining experience by hands-on activities in lab-based environment, making physical models and structural testing of models by learning through make and break concepts. He also teaches the art of adapting international methodologies and construction techniques by adapting them to native conditions. The concept of think global, act local, and be vocal, making students aware of current global industry trends in, de in design and construction by formulating and conducting frequent thematic workshops by various domains or disciplines and specialist vendors and prov providing clean and sustainable environment, learning environment to students in the online and face-to-face -face classroom. He effectively uses two methodologies of teaching, namely PBL, which is problem-based learning, and PPBL, problem and project-based learning, whereby setting a problem in an assignment, which is solved by developing a project by relying on today's task and yesterday's experience. He believes gaming and creation are activities which have a potential for computational thinking skills, which are enhanced by using Grasshopper or Rhino kind of softwares in preparing shell and form finding projects or models. He uses hepatic exercises utilized to learn with concept of think architecture and field structure concepts. He is on immersive learning journey with real world case studies business decision related projects and Cape Stone project development, a data driven mindset to manage, visualize and analyze the data effectively. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our uh, invitation and being part of our FDP as today's session speaker. We welcome you, sir, and over to you. Thank you, Ladika, ma'am, for giving this introduction. And I also take this opportunity to thank basically the Dhyanand School of uh, Institute and the uh, uh, CUA training at TRC Bhopal for giving me this opportunity to be speaker for this uh, session uh, in which I'll be talking about awakening architecture through technology. Let me first share my screen. Can you all see the presentation? Yes, sir. Okay, if that is so, first of all, let me first tell you, architecture is a discipline which is always driven by technology. We have to be abreast with it. We cannot be insulated for with the technology which is happening all around us. Remember Nokia, when the Android had come, so Nokia once was a leader in basically the uh, mobile technology. Whereas once the Android software had come, so they didn't take a cognizance of that and they were on in their own steam. What happened later on? Nokia went into downfall and other lead players had taken uh, forward. Similarly is a case which happened to Kotak. So when 
the filming or the camera industry, they were not, they were still on those films and reels and processing, making images from there. They, they were not bothered about digital technology, which had taken place and had totally revolutionized the camera making or filmmaking and images. So they were all left behind. Similar is a case with architects. In case we, in our profession, which is mostly driven by technology, if we are not abreast with what is happening all around, then we'll be left behind. So it is basically the time. We can't, we can't be sleeping all the time. We have to wake up and to be abreast with what is happening all around. See who all are the famous architects who are there? They, were, they could only become leaders because they were ahead of the time. See the case of Frank Lloyd Wright, where he started organic architecture. Carbuzier, he started with those uh, concrete forms and other things. And also see what happens to Frank Gehry and what is happening to Norman Foster and what is happening to Zahidi. They were all ahead of the time and they were all in tune with what was latest. With that as a premise, I thought uh, I'll just do some research work on this and see what are the skill sets which is required. So I began my journey. Once this topic was given to me, I began my journey by just first understanding. So let me first understand as what is the skill set which is required right now for an architect and even for our uh, students who, to whom we are teaching. Uh, hence, 20 or 30 years hence. So what is the skill set which they will be requiring? We have we don't have to teach them or we don't have to look towards past, but we have to see the future. In case we teach our students the past, they will not be in tune with what is happening all around. Like, like already, even today now also, if you see, we are just talking about parametric and other things. So parametric and all is all gone back. And now AI and uh, ML and DL has taken over. And big data has all taken over. And we in India, still in our institutes, don't teach this parametric design. So we must be aware of what are the skill set which is required for our students as well as for our architects. Similarly, I did some research and then just formulated as for the future in architecture, what will be the three pillars or the three three main elements which will be driving architecture. So we'll be talking about that. Then to go to, uh, towards that pillar, the drivers which are contributing towards that change. So I'll be talking about those three drivers. And then I have just formulated a kind of a suggestive pentagon for this change, which will be having effect on our design thinking in our architecture. And, and last, I'll be just talking about what are the emerging technology and techniques which is now available. So we'll be ju just going step one by one. So let's see as to what are the skill set which should be required. Like in the 21st century, like what I said in the beginning, that we as an architect, that because things are moving so fast and fluid. So what is happening is whatever we have learned in our days, well, we have to unlearn those and start learning, relearning what is now required for us to be there. So that means in 21st century, it is only for those people who are ready to earn their past and what, what knowledge they've got and relearn what is happening all around. So the three pillars which I thought is going to be there is basically intelligent, flexibility, and sustainability. I'll be just talking about that in my later view fold. Then the drivers which will be making this change will be technology. That is, our uh, profession is totally driven by technology, latest changes which are happening there. And the techniques, like the uh, techniques, remember in the beginning, what you we used to have post lintel construction, uh, column beam construction, then we moved on to arches. The arches, the keystone was formed, to the technique of making arches had come, then the technique of making dome had come. And then we moved towards, okay, we wanted to go higher, domes were making wall thicker, abutment walls were thicker to make it thinner. We had gone into those flying buttresses and other things. We uh, went tall. Then with the advent of technology, that means uh, with the steel, you know, industrial revolution taking place. So we started constructing in steel. So high rise buildings were coming into play. And as it is a user requirement is also changing. Similarly, now if you see, we have this fluid forms and concrete, which was there is also come into picture. So all these new materials are really innovating and coming up day and day and keeping us a challenge for our architect to learn and as well as to de design and include it into our projects. 
And similarly, a lot of activities are taking place in materials. We have self-healing materials, where we have materials which is uh, pervasive material, we have material which are more responsive to nature. So we have to be abreast with these uh, values and these changes. So these are the drivers which make us to change. And then I, whatever changes which is there, I made it into a kind of a pentagon. And we're talking about that, how the modular design, parametric design, generative design, computer design or autonomous design vehicles and equipments are helping us and uh, moving us forward. Now, as our students and graduates who are just passing, they should have these skill sets. Basically, the knowledge, the main discipline knowledge, which is there of our discipline has to be taught to him. The skill sets, that is the latest skill sets related to communication, critical thinking, problem thinking, analytic research related skills, reflective thinking or self-directed learnings have to be taught. Even the behavior changes or the attitude changes to our students have to be taught so that they are future ready once they go out into the field and they should be able to work in a team. They should, they should also able to be become a leader. They should have scientific reasoning. They should also be able to take everyone along. They should have their leadership quality. And I also believe that whatever learning we've got, like learn, unlearn, relearn, that means we have the process of lifelong learning. So learning, that means teaching which happens happens in four ways or learning which happen happens in four ways. Learning which is done by a teacher, learning which I learn from my colleague and peers, learning which I do myself and research which I've done it now. And it's a, and learning, attending these FDPs and other things is all lifelong learning which we all have to do. Now let's come to basically the three pillars. So the three pillars, like I already told you right in the beginning that architecture is a technology in, intensive uh, uh, discipline where where not even in the process of designing the technology comes into play, but it also comes into play once we are producing and making our structure. So that means all these elements have to be incorporated and to be integrated in our, basically uh, the curriculum, which we teach at the school and institution level. Whereas as architects, we also know that this is basically what is happening is it's a continuous process of innovation which is happening in architectural field. So this innovation and continuously ev evolution is happening because there is a change in user demand every day. It's like what has happened to COVID. Now suddenly you got to bring in flexibility into, it, into play because those uh, hospitals which were designed for a particular scale has to be now fitted to a different kind of skills. Now, what is happening to offices? They are shrinking because work from home environment is coming into play and see how the residential designs are made, being made. Now work from home has come. So more flexibility and more space is required for that. So that means whatever my future design has to be futuristic and has to be flexibility, in it has to be incorporated in that. And the climate aspect has also have to be incorporated in that. That's why sustainability factor comes into play. We don't have to look towards past, but we have to look towards future. And there has to be changes, climatic changes which are taking place has to be incorporated. Similarly, the first factor of intelligence that is now architectural design is basically happening. There's automation which is happening in a lot of design processes. So what has happened to automation is automation has given us now power of making concurrent design. That means the design which is happening simultaneously. That means I'm also designing, my structural engineer is also there, MVP person is also there. We're all working towards one model that is a BIM model and everybody is having concurrent design thing is going on so that there is no loss of information and there is uh, there, there is shortage. We have squeezed the time, but we have collaborated uh, together and then we have come out with solutions. So this is what is also happening. And simultaneously, the thing which is happening is also happening in our production field as what we are making on ground. There, we are, instead of going for essential thing, we now we are going for concrete thing. That means you have started fabricated or prefabricated structures have come into play. The pre stress structures have come into play. Remember those pods. Now, when a new concept which has come in, the pods are made somewhere else. They are required at certain times and those pods are fitted. The pods are, could be the toilets and other things which is used and put in, in the design at the construction stage and then the construction process happens. So that the three thing, pillar which is there is intelligence, that is AI and uh, AR, VR and blockchain 
big data, all those things is happening because of the intelligence thing which is happening. Flexibility because of the user requirement is keep on changing because of the needs which is happening is also changing like what used to happen in incremental kind of houses is there or, or the model thing uh, you design uh, based on modularity so that modules are designed and you just fit in you plug in those modules like, just like in lego you have that piano thing which is just uh, fitted in those things those cubes are just fitted in there and last factor is sustainability that means the climate change and that is the most important thing which you all have to agree to now once we know this uh, these are the basically pillars of change. So I, what I've just done is basically for any architectural firm or any architectural institute or any architecture uh, profession, the architectural office should have these things. In. That is what I have uh, displayed right at the right corner where you can just see that you have got uh, uh, your, uh, I'll just put a pointer. Okay, you have this. 2D and 3D representations, you have BIM models, you have a parametric design, you have GIS, you have digital fabrication, simulation, environmental technology and techn building techniques like Mevron technology, slip-on technology, slab technology, those are the things which have to be taught to us, students have to be known to all of us. Also like uh, day before yesterday, you are just, uh, uh, architect Manjurath has given another kind of a technology where you were just making structures with the steel structures, with that flat slab and then capital and column. So that kind of a technology has to be known to all of us and has to be also taught to our students so that they are also future ready once they go into the field. And lastly, the most important thing which is happening is this programming, coding, and scripting. We'll be talking about that. These 10 features are just put it in a pentagon that is modular. We have just clubbed together. We'll see what all, all I've clubbed where modular design, parametric design, autonomous uh, design vehicles and equipment, so drones and self driven cars, and equipment is happening, generative design and computer aided design. So we'll just see those things also. Like this is what is, if you come to modular design, the most important thing, uh, part of this modular design is, if you see, is your, basically the technology where you have pre-stress, pre-cast and prefab, like the uh, government of India, the, that is Hindustan Prefabricated Limited and BMTPC or uh, the global, uh, uh, global Housing Technological Challenge. Uh, had given us these lighthouse projects, which were under the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, had given us these six technology, which are the latest technology, I'll be talking about that, uh, is there for the precast and prefab. Then in our design thinking, like I've already told you, you've got to be flexible, you've got to have mobility, dynamic or transformation. Like if you see the mobility and dynamism is what has happened is like, like FIFA Qatar Stadium, which is being uh, constructed for that football uh, FIFA tournament. And after the tournament is over, those containers and all will be shipped to another place and will be constructed somewhere else. That means reuse, re-adoptability and transformability of spaces, what has happened. Same thing is also happening if you see for printing, the 3D printing. Now you are gone into 3D printing, talking about that once we go into further details as to how you minimize the waste. And there's another concept which is coming is a circular economy. Circular economy, no, otherwise it was a linear economy. Linear economy, there's some wastages. Whereas in circular economy, whatever is the output which is coming is reused and recycled. Like there is an architect, like I told earlier also, previously also, there is this young architect who's working in South who is working with construction domination waste. That means he's making his walls and uh, construction with the construction uh, demolition waste which comes and he reuses that in his projects and then construct projects. So similarly, there are architects who are also working in North where they are using this construction demolition waste and can be used in our roads, can also be used in walls, can also be used in uh, as a filling material. So that means there, there is uh, uh, automatically reuse and recycling thing which is happening. And that means this is also helping us in sustainability. And another thing is, another thing which has happened is the uh, also coming and the automation is also coming. So because of robotic thing and automation, the, everything is now constructed very fast and, and the quality is what is assured because all these things they've been done at a factory scale and that's why you can monitor the quality and, and the assurance is given to our clients that the, uh, the product which has been uh, made is of a, a, a mute, uh, is of, of a good quality. Okay, now, 
Another thing is now in the second aspect, what is what's there in the modeler? I'll be talking in further detail as to what is there in those modeling in the emerging technology. Now, next factor is what was the computer-aided design? Now, computer-aided design only remember the days we used to have make sketches with pens and all in uh, with pencils and all. Then with the with rotating thing coming into the play, we had we started making drawings in inks and all. Then uh, mechanical drafter and parallel bar and then in T square. Then suddenly we had these computers. Everything was now made on computer previously. So what is the drawback which is in computer is that, that we don't, the student don't get uh, importance or, or attached to the scale as to what they are drawing because everything in computer is not just one is one scale. So the final output, once you take out those prints, then you come to know, okay, okay, this is what I'm getting at that space I'm getting. So whatever we are doing is basically it is what is happening is computer aided drafting is what is happening. It's not computer aided design, which is happening unless until the, uh, that means the technology of computer was not being used. It was only started getting used when the computational design things have come into play. Once the, uh, like Frank Gehry started designing buildings with the Ketria, then, then only the things had started coming in and then only the technology which was available in the computer was getting used to it. I'll be talking about that in our parametric design. But for the computer aided, for the passive design things, that is we started from uh, uh, your pen, you started uh, you're making drawings in basically 2D drawings in AutoCAD, and then you started making drawings in 3D uh, AutoCAD, and then suddenly revolution will come with BIM, that is building information modeling, where everything is made in that 3D model and everything is concurrently done in the 3D model. I'll be talking about that as to how BIM has totally changed or revolutionized the whatever is happening in computer design. And remember, previously we used to make those sketches or, or those perspectives, one, uh, one point perspective or two point perspectives. And now all those things, once we made 3D model, we had this walkthroughs going on, making in 3D Max and other things. Now that all changed with the invent of basically VR, the virtual reality or the augmented reality and mixed reality. So everything changed. Now I can speak with my, I can showcase my drawing and my design to my client in VR and AR and can take him to the tour as to what I'm designing. And I can also make changes simultaneously whenever it is required. So this all could be possible when BIM was integrated with VR and AR and MR. And for this, let me tell you, for this, what now I'm no longer limited to the space which is required basically or the computation power which is required basically for my laptop. Now we have all moved all this model and all, all this software are all moved into computer uh, cloud computing where everything is happening at backend at a server level. And this computing power is increasing every two years. We are getting new, new materials and speed of uh, machine and speed of equipment is also changing uh, very fast. And in India, for the work for this, uh, basically BIM, AutoCAD, and other thing, we got it from Chakresh Jain, his company, uh, Capricord, is doing that thing for us. And we are also inviting him uh, as lectures to our students. Same way, Trezy is another Indian company which is working on VR and AR. And we are, uh, Gautam uh, Tiwari is there. And one of our students is also there with it going, who's helping him. And they also come and teach us about what are the VR and AR, the MRs, uh, which is used in architecture. So we as architect and, and we as academia should uh, tell our students about this latest technology, which is happening all around. So that they, once they go out in industry, they are ready for these uh, things and they, they can accept all these challenges. Next thing which happened is totally the generative design. Now I've got everything done up in BIM and all. I started with 2D and 3D and then I got BIM and now I've moved into something known as generative design. So generative design came into picture because of the big data which is there. So whatever I make any click and other things so that big data is all stored somewhere, somewhere and somewhere. And then you suddenly start getting uh, messages for that and how it comes, I'll be talking about that. So the big data was another thing which has come into play, the new software, which has come in also uh, has come into our play. Then you have this AI that is art artificial intel intelligence, machine learning in DL. Like what we do on our software, I pick up something, I, I search for something, certainly I uh, see that and certainly I see my whole 
my home uh, my laptop and even my uh, uh, your facebook account or even my mobile is flooded with the messages to what I have uh, searched early this all is happening because of the ai ml and dl because the machine is learning throughout as to what i am looking and what i am searching for and is giving me solutions to that suggestive solutions to that so basically yeah, let me tell you the generative design doesn't mean the architects are redundant no Generative designing basically giving us uh, more opportunities, giving us more uh, uh, options, and it's optimizing my design. But I, at other end, from those solutions which I'm getting, I'm making an informed decision as to this is what is best for my architect and for uh, for my client and for my user. So that means it's a generative design is a process which helps us basically to make informed decisions. Info, just stressed on informed decision. They themselves will give me optimized solution, but out of those optimized solution, which is best suited for me, it has to be selected by me. End of the day, everything is with me. If I'm abreast with technology, I'll be able to take that informed decision. Then another is you know, freely available software where uh, like scripting and other thing which is done is Google uh, Colab. So from there, uh, Python uh, uh, learning and scripting is done there. I can put in, uh, uh, basically import whatever the code which is already generated. That how, if I make a bubble diagram, and I'll show you that if I make a bubble diagram, if I've got two story house, two bedroom house, I, how I can, it'll give me a solution or that solution will come after I put data into that, uh, into my scripting and programming. From that only it will come and select those things. Okay. So this is what happened in generative design. Next we also moved into basically this uh, autonomous design vehicles and equipment. Now what is happening is this drone things is just coming in, the self-driven vehicle and loaders are coming in, the variable technology is coming in. So there is some technology which is on a leader. So this is basically nothing in light detection and ranging technology. So this technology, it is something also called laser scanning and this and 3D scanning. So this is the technology which basically is taken to the site and also used in on historical sites and uh, conservation projects also, where it is you know, fitted on top of the equipment or this is also uh, placed on top of the basic, basically self-driven self car, which is happening. That is what is happening is a leader technology will just scan the roads what all is there in the roads and basically whatever steering I'm doing left, right, it, so that all will be recorded through machine learning in computer. So he will know, okay, if, if that kind of a thing comes again and he makes a 3D model out of it and that 3D model is tested with what is, is available with me and can tell me the faults which is there. That means with this little tech, uh, little technology, what I'm doing is, if you see down below, that this robot is going to site and just making those pictures and taking those and just making it 3D, 3D soft or 3D uh, model out of it. Now that 3D model, which is I have already prepared, which is there from my BIM, it's all tested from there and can see what are the discrepancies in it is also known. So I'll just show you as to how uh, we'll just see, see a small video. I hope it works now. Can you all see this and hear this video? Here at Foster and yes, Partners, sir. we, we have been at the full from okay. the free search so for this the is what is, environment you know, uh, for over 50 years. Norman Foster has done it. They we have, have teamed up with Boston Dynamics this. as part of their early adopter program for Spot, the semi anonymous robot, to investigate how to can push the boundaries of design and construction while enhancing productivity, efficiency, and collaboration. It could be put on any robots or anything, and also could be put on any helmets and all. 3D laser scanning technology to capture and monitor on-site progress was integrated into a strategic plan developed by our Applied Research and Development Group. This so enables us to capture constant, data quick from and there. consistent scans And automatically at the, the back end, the 3D model that is made. This precision monitoring has progress to can be checked with whatever I have made it in BIM. So I can know the errors Standing which are there. Processing times have been reduced from weeks to a matter of days while freeing up staff resource. Spot's remote control features greatly improve site visit safety and efficiency. Together with its ability to follow a pre mapped route, Spot provides consistent repeated scans, navigates difficult terrain, and can access hard-to-reach areas on site. 
this technology could be used to create four-dimensional models of our buildings, highlighting how they change over time. Combined with data from sensors that read environmental conditions and occupancy, we can create an intricate model of how people, furnishings, and environmental conditions interact. These four-dimensional models could become virtual collaboration spaces. So, okay, with this kind, this kind of technology, like the same thing is fitted there also on the uh, on uh, on the robo machine which is there down below. So you get everything, all data is given to you, and then you can collaborate and see as to what are the errors and available. No longer now, no longer we have to be dependent on those micro workstation measuring thing by uh, your scales and other things, and then making those as built drawings. So those things can be made automatically by this technology which is available to us and can be integrated and can be uh, now evaluate, evaluated through the BIM model, which I have already made early. Now, another thing which has happened is basically is the field which is having in parametric design. So parametric design is basically nothing. I'll just uh, tell you from, if you see down below, I've got this challenges. That means the traditional method is you've got your challenge. Okay, I have to make some design. I've got certain data with me. So I've got the tangible data. I've got intangible data that is given to me. It goes to my head as an architect. I, through my intuitive knowledge, I design something. And because of the experience, I design the building. And I'm unable to compute as to data, which is there, like the data or the daylight data or your sunlight data or the wind movement data, all has to be done manually. Manually. Then I get a solution and that solution I make a design and that design once it is built, then only it is tested and seen whether it is successful or not. Whereas in parametric design, it is the other way around. You have your challenges, everything which is there earlier. You've got data, you've got tangible data, intangible data. Tangible data goes into your computational thing and we're through the mathematically like wind, your sun movement, your daylight, and whatever the thermal comfort, all these things is all tangible uh, data is all put in the uh, computational computer and, and, and gives you an output. Whereas all intangible data as a user requirement, as well as your user behavior and the user narrative is all done by architect and both of them combined together to come up with a solution. And that solution is then tested and then optimized and then this is the way how the parametric design works. So that means in started with basically, you started with basically a rivet, where you started with the 3D model or Rhino, where you have got just the basically uh, basic data, which is, or, or the basic model is available to it. To that basic model, you start attaching. Now you're moving to, from parametric to computational design by start attaching your algorithm through it. That means you are doing it this same exercise in Grasshopper in case you're working with Rhino. And you're also doing the same thing in Dynamo Studio in case you're working with Rivet. Now, here you've done your computational design to your whatever design you've made. And then it will just give you generative designs is all given by Flinch 3D and Refinery. In case it is you're working in an AutoCAD platform, Flinch 3D is what is basically been developed by BRAC, that is a block research group. And Zahadi codes have also, uh, in collaboration with BLOCK, is also working on this, uh, this generative kind of a design. And what whatever I've talked about right there in the beginning is RAT Lab is now a research architecture and technology lab, uh, which is done by one of our alumni of Shishant, who is a leader in it. And he is the one who is uh, taking classes and teaching us with all parametric designs and other things. That means what is there is you make something in Rhino, then you fix its uh, boundary condition, then you find out form finding in it, then you uh, do optimization of the geometry of the form finding, then you, you take it in the grasshopper where you do all the algorithm and all is all fixed. Then from Caramba software, which is available, you do structural analysis, structural uh, optimization of the work is done. And then you get the product, which is basically totally holistically designed. So this is how parametric design works. And I'll be just talking about this. I've just given you introduction. I'll be talking about in detail in my next uh, slides also. Now, coming back to the first. Now, the seeing after knowing the Pentagon, now step by step, let's see what are the emerging technology and techniques which is taking place in the modular construction. That is the first aspect which I talked about where you got uh, prefab and uh, precast solutions which is available. Now, the three, six technology which is now readily available. Now, these are the technology which is readily available in India. 
Okay, and um, but people, some of us are not even aware of this. That is a global housing technological challenge and the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana was done by the Hindustan Prefabricated Limited or BMT TPC. And uh, in our previous one of the sessions, their executive director had come and had given us this knowledge. And I, and let me tell you, we in Shishant have already in our fourth year, we have used these kinds of a technology in our BC projects and taught these things to students. That means the emerging technology, which is there is engineering Formbuck system. That is Mevron system, which is, it's a Malaysian system, which is of alum aluminum Formbuck, which is there on the left side is all made. And then now with this new, kind of a technology which is available to us, the construction time from seven, 10 days as per the AD is reduced to three, three days or two days. Or similarly, you got this tunnel kind of a technology where your columns and beams, or your walls and slabs are casted together and you get this blocks kind of a thing that can be placed. And next technology is stain place technology system where you have got insulating concrete from the system is where it stays in place, where EPS is used that is similar to thermocol and all along with this wire gauge and all is used. And in between you igniting and other thing is done for the concrete and the system stays in place. And another is the structural stain place form of system, which is there on the right side. If you see on the right, uh, uh, right top side is what I've uh, kept in place. That is stain place technology form work is of two types. So insulated concrete form work system or stay, uh, structural state uh, system, which is there. You just see those images uh, at uh, in between where all the cross sections of the wall sections is, is been shown. And that is how they have all done it. And it is all this technology is in place in India and can be used. Another one is your light gauge structural system, like how this COVID thing and other thing happened because they have used this light gauge structural system. In the steel structure system, if you see, there are two kinds of things uh, which has happened. That is light gauge structural steel system and hot roll structural steel uh, system. No, 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 light gauge structural steel system is a cold form of uh, steel structures. Now, this is what is also happening. Now, the expansion, a lot of expansion oh. has happened in Delhi government where all the schools and other things were expanded, where you, if in case you want to attach one floor on top of it, you can use this light gauge structural system and is very comfortable to be used for single story to three story structures. And other one is a hot rolled structural system where, where you have got this built in section, like PEB structure, the pre engineering building uh, is there, buildings which is there, pre engineering buildings. So if you see on the bottom right side, there you can see the columns and all the slabs and all is all made of built up steel sections, hot rolled steel sections and your built up sections are being used. And this way, what happens is your construction speed actually increases and you are able to deliver the same product to your client within shorter span of time. And the last one is what is basically your precast concrete structure, structure that is your 3D that is what you are making in 3D structure or 2D structure where you are split up into basically column, beams, and other things. All this new technology kind of formwork structure has got conventional, let me tell you, conventional foundation. Because still we have not gone into the prefabricated foundation, but still for these uh, technology and techniques to happen, they have worked out. Uh, with basically the conventional structural foundation system for this. Okay, so where we are, if you look at this, where we are, we started, we are at level three. We have still not reached level four. Let me just tell you what is level zero. Level zero is what we now conventionally do. Level one is what is your pre-engineering buildings, which we have. Level two is where you have your planar system, where you put all your column beam structures, which is of, of single plane, 2D, uh, your wall system, you've got your column, you've got beam, and you've got floors. Those are all joined together separately too. And you have a lot of junctions. So those that is the reason the it was not going ahead properly because the detailing, which was required for junction between these column beams and floors were uh, taking time and was not uh, uh, developed uh, uh, good. So there was some bad detailing which was happening. That's why this was not progressing earlier. Otherwise this uh, pre, uh, 
Prikas think technology was available to us. Now with the invent of technology and with new materials and with techniques available to us, now we are going ahead and uh, with these also. Now level three is what is you're making volumetrically, you're making your 3D, your uh, rooms and just like uh, logo blocks, you're going and fitting in that. Okay, but level four is another level where it is known as prefabricated, pre-finished volumetric construction where all your model, everything is made up in factory. It's all prefabric, it's all pre-finished paints, your uh, HVAC, everything is all dovetail into it. You're just going there and putting it on site and just joining one with another. So that is the level which is happening. So this is what is, uh, there's a company known as, if you Google it, broad company in China is one, it's propagating that. Or if you have a modular integrated company, which is there in Hong Kong and Singapore is also doing this kind of a work. And we in India are still not gone into level four. We are still at level three. So next step for us is basically going into level four, which is there, which I've represented in blue. So image of that is there on your right, uh, on the right side, if you see, the, how the pre-fitted or pre-finished uh, structures are joined together one by one and you just have construction which is coming up. And top of it, if you have seen the slide, that is basically your hot roll, uh, your built up sections and uh, joined together and then you can make, uh, they're made multi-story buildings with this in China. And even in Chandigarh also, uh, people have also made this building, which is uh, your uh, 10 days or 15 days, they were, they were able to do it. But the foundation and all were prepared pre, uh, uh, beforehand only. That means next, another thing which is of more important is basically is known as DFMA. That is designed for manufacturing and assembly. That is a word which we are all going to talk about it in future. So that is what is uh, going and connecting us to PPVC. That is prefabricated, pre-finished volumetric construction. Okay, so on bottom right, I've just shown the global housing technological challenge in India, which has just taken place, where we're all, they, they have given, if you just Google the site of uh, GHTC, and uh, there you will be able to provide the uh, technical support and providers which are available in India for these technologies, and they are working on it, and they are making these houses under Pradhan Mantri Abbas Yojana. This is as far as modular construction technology, which is happening. Now let's see what is happening to your basically computer aided design. Now these are the software which I have just listed out. That is where you required for uh, us uh, uh, if you have to teach our students. Uh, we also have to be aware of this AutoCAD, 3D Max, Revert, SketchUp, Photo Illustrator, Photoshop, GIS, Rhinosur, Glasshopper, Processing, Microsoft. So these are the software which is required. Survey was done where you can just see the percentage as to what is the thing which is required. In this, basically, what happened was, like I told you in the beginning, that Katia, that is, okay, uh, uh, which was uh, basically adopted by uh, Frank Gehry in the design of uh, Bilbao, uh, Bilbao Museum. In where he had designed, basically it is computer, aided three-dimensional interactive application software. Now this software is developed by aerospace company like the uh, uh, like this, uh, which is the latest one, which is coming from, uh, uh, we, we are getting uh, from French government. Uh, Dissolt system is the one who has developed this software. And there in this cat here, you got this CAD, which is just talking about the uh, AutoCAD of drawings. And then you've got uh, computer-aided engineering, and then you've got this computer-aided manufacturing. So this is where fabrication, like uh, for Bilbao, uh, Bilbao uh, project, uh, Frank Gehry had to make those titanium plate, and these titanium plate has to be made in such a way that there is least amount of wastages that could only be done through this CAM KTIA software. Okay, now this KTIA has also got uh, in, into 3D as well as uh, has gone into V5, but now we have gone beyond KTIA and we have just gone into basically those codes and other things. So that is where the development which has just taken place. Like down below, if you see, I've just spelled out what are the software which is available for design automation, which is a software which is available for your com uh, computational modeling and which is the software which is available for your generative design and the machine learning. So if you move one step ahead, that means from modeler, you have made everything building in a modeler construction. You have relied on computer-aided design for your manufacturing and prefabrication. 
Now you come to a stage is, which is known as parametrism. So parametrism is nothing but it is an architectural programming language. That means you are just playing around with parameters and adding data to it so that you come up with different shapes and forms. And that too, previously we used to do it ourselves, but now with the computer knowledge, you will be able to do it within seconds. You get within seconds, you get countless outputs are being available to us. And then from their outputs, you can make any informed decisions. That means what you see here is in the green is what is your basically your component and these lines which is connecting them is what is they call in uh, parametric software as or in the grasshopper they call it as wires so they give the interrelationship which happens and because of this and to make it into generative mode they've got the slider so that you can slide that you can change the parameters of that and then come up with your computational design like for example in case i've got a tower which is there in a city, which is mostly, it is clouded in nature. So how will you uh, calculate as the amount of daylight it's going to have a particular time of the year? Now with these tools, Grasshopper, these tools, which is available to us, you can do it within minutes. You've got this model, which is made up in uh, uh, Rhino and uh, you've done your algorithm attached to it. And then you can uh, simulate the activities and they can simply tell you within appropriate time as to which all parameters have to be optimized and you get a solution to it as to, okay, how much amount of daylight you're going to get in that particular room, whether it's 80%, 90% or 60%, uh, you can just change the direction of that room while designing and you will get another optimization done for it. So this is how they work in parametric software. That is, you have gone basically from your computer aided drafting to you've got your 3D model. So 3D model for each wall, windows, floors is all you're attaching geometry to it. That you uh, that becomes your parametric modeling, and that parametric modeling through computerization with the algorithm attached to it, you're changing your your all this parameters interrelatedly are connected through that algorithm and can change and can give you then uh, give you solutions or options uh, of, uh, are generated from which you get to optimize solution and which you can design later on. That means what is happening is you have your CAD, out of that CAD come your 3D model, that BIM, out, of, out to that BIM, the parameters, you do the computational design, and through that competition design, you get the generative design. Now, generative design is basically nothing. It is a subset. It is a subset. It is not going to replace anything. It is a subset of what your basically computational design. And, and from there, you will get more informed decision. Like if you see on the right side, I've got this green, green kind of a square, um, uh, your uh, tower. And then to that tower, if I start attaching the elements to it, if I I'd start att attaching the boundary condition, if I start attaching the basically the nodal conditions and other things to it, and then in the end, I get the solution. Now, through this parametric software, which was made in 1997, and there, first time that Singhai Tower was also made through using this parametric software. Okay. Now, I'll come to next, another one which is another most important thing after you've got this parametric thing, which is done up there. Now, another thing which I've come up is basically your AI, that is artificial intelligence. So the ab ability of technology to make decisions independent of human inputs. So the subset of that is basically ML. ML is nothing but ability or technology to learn from past experiences. Like I gave you that example, in if I use, if I download, there's a software known as Lobe, L-O-B-E. And there you can just load it on your computer desktop and then whatever activities you're going to do, it's going to record that and then we'll start giving you solutions for that. So basically it is also like I told you, if you are going in a, uh, if you are driving in a car, if any car, which is basically automated, that, that auto autonomous self-driven car, which is there, it takes particular route. So that route through that leader technology will make uh, one 3D and that 3D will be stored at somewhere. So that uh, 3D which is stored somewhere, a moment I go next time to the same route, I'll be guided towards that because already I've gone through the same process. A similar thing happens in your machine learning that it learns from the past experience. So it is actually deals with a lot of data. So data which is available in machine learning is of three types, basically supervised data, 
unsupervised data and reinforced data. Supervised data is that data which is labeled, like uh, height, weight, and other things. It's all labeled. Unsupervised data is that data which is not labeled, but which is clustered based on the similarities of the particular element and can be uh, made together. And reinforced data is combination of supervised and uns unsupervised data. So this is how machine learning, once we download in our, in, in our, uh, uh, in our computer and automatically this uh, Google is doing the same thing. Remember if I like every day I go through uh, college for, to teach. So it gives me the, uh, it calculates the distance from my workplace to the uh, home place. And it gives me automatically gives me message. Okay, this much time for you to reach because already I have gone through that. So machine has already known that thing and already that is recorded. So it is all giving me solutions from my past experiences. So algorithm is made accordingly. So another thing which has happened from machine learning after I've got this machine learning, there's something known as deep learning. Now deep learning is nothing. It is just using multiple layers of. Uh, your neural network algorithm, that different algorithm, which is there, sequential algorithm are there, which works based on what our human brain works. Okay, so you've got ANN, which is basically, uh, this works on your numerical uh, values, CNN, which works on images, RNN, which works on basically your time-based solutions. So this is how deep learning happens. If you see artificial intelligence generate design options, Using this set of algorithm, which I've told you in deep learning, it gives you multiple design options and solutions for a specific designs based on your material, your, your parameters of material, budget and building techniques. And you also have to pick up one solution out of it, which is best suited for you. So this, if you see, I've already told you, uh, Google Colab is the software which is available. Then in between, I uh, where I'm flashing right now is where you have got this log. And and on my left side, if I see, I've just put in for a, 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 a for any project, we've just put in the user requirement, the material and inside, so it's given me option. The next thing which has happened from DL is basically GAN. So GAN is another, is another thing that is basically generative adversarial layout refinery networks. So that means this is what, don't 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 get afraid that only architects are redundant. No, this just gives you helps you gives you solutions. So AI based generative design is a is a, is a co partner. It's helping you basically. It helps you solve complex problems of architectural engineering and the product design problems. So in a faster way and create multiple design options. So I'll just show you one like how in this. With this bubble diagram, so this is what somebody has built it in uh, in basically uh, Google Colab. So this whole uh, programming thing, which is done, just see this on left side. Can you all see this? Is it is it visible to all? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Just see with this bubble diagram. He's just changing balcony. And then suddenly, because you have put in a lot of sets of data, which is available to that, it compares that data and gives you, you add a different node, you add one room to it. Okay, he's added the storage thing. Suddenly you generated design, you get something. So that means it work first works on the boundary. Then it works on the, uh, the areas, which is there. Then it works on the relationship, which is coming. And then you get more examples. See, immediately he's generated certain plans. So you get more examples through this. So you can just, so this is what is done in basically Google Colab. So I'm just giving you the final product of, I'm just showing you the final product of it. So somebody has done this. So this is where from this generative software, you uh, under this house GAN, you will able to get two bedroom and three bedroom. And then you can, whatever, it's a, it's a sky is the limit for it basically. Okay, so uh, do I go back and stop this? Okay, okay. So this is how this is how AI is just helping us. So AI is not a master. You yourself are still the master of it because the ultimate decision you have to take. So be careful in that. Okay. Now another after you learn modeler, after we learn computer aided, parametric AI, ML, and DL. 
we move into another field which is known as basically your sorry let me first end show i think ye maine slide kahi isko hide to nahi kar diya ah okay sorry okay now can you all see this slide of big data yes sir hello how ah, okay now you can see this okay now after i have done modeler after after i done computer aided design parametric ai ml the next thing which is happening was big data big data is what you are doing your clicks and all i am doing every day it's being stored somewhere some server somewhere so this data comes from everywhere like sensors are there to collect this data and like the climatical information is there like once i was doing my mtech that time uh, there was this concept of basically they say okay while during construction we'll be putting some sensors in the building so that we'll be able to later on record those things so this happens in 90s now this has become reality now now people are doing the same thing that means you are basically what you are doing is you are just testing as to what is happening to the building which you have constructed and there you are getting obtaining data for that so whatever clicks and all you are doing it like you are swapping credit card you are emailing your posts your social media sites and other things so those data are collected somewhere okay and then that that data is the one which is given to researchers which is given to these people like the, these are the where this is the fight which is happening between google facebook and and your tweet uh, twitter and they are the one who are just fighting for this now the new latest thing which has come is metaverse so that is another different level altogether now we will be just restricting ourselves to okay uh, big data so big data is actually impacting our cities our building design and also construction let me tell you at 2010 this data was basically one zettabyte was uh, this was just 2 2 zettabyte and now at at uh, 2020 this big data has gone gone up basically to basically your 50 zettabyte and uh, and at uh, 2030 it is going to be at 175 zettabyte so much amount of data will be one which is available now one zettabyte is equal to 1 billion tetrabyte and one tetrabyte is equal to one uh, uh, tetrabyte is equal to 1 trillion byte so that is what is the thing which i am talking about so much amount of data is what is available so that all has to be computed somewhere for that computer uh, cloud computing technology is coming to play so what big data is telling us is basically we are doing as to what you can see on the right side is we are it is helping us designing for a citizen that means the doing analysis of the big data using data to better match user need like uh, i want to know okay i'm designing any public space so he'll be just doing data analysis as to how many times to that public space how many people what is the footfall which is happening so you come to know okay that is the footfall so that is the requirement which is there which is uh, to be constructed to be kept in mind while designing so that means this big big data is also helping all of us in uh, our design process now we go to client so what is the requirement of client now this client is not satisfied with one design now he client is now he is demanding for more design solutions he says okay i want 20 30 40 previously we used to show only two solutions or three solutions now he says okay i want to see more solutions so that means client is just wanting us to do more set of drawings or more set of models or solutions he wants us to give him another thing which client is also demanding is the data from the building he says ki whatever you done okay whatever the data whatever the building is going to be constructed what is going to be the data which is required for efficiently running this building that is what is what will be the hvac need what will be mep needs what will be your water needs those things all have to be known and has to be told to the client right at the beginning he also becomes smarter so we also have to become smarter so we also have to know how to deal with this big data another thing is Is because of this 3D modeling thing which you are doing, you are making generating something in BIM. So what is happening is basically that all data you can test it. You can test. I'll tell you how we do those testing. You can test this data uh, or that 3D model 
in uh, in by another software by open studio you you do it by dimensions okay what is going to be the thermal comfort which is going to be there so those all testing and all is all done up if we make all design or if our design thinking is there starting from making the thing in your bim models okay and this is also helping our city planners and our uh, people who are there at municipality basically to design the cities or smart cities and other things are all using this big data. They are analyzing, they see, okay, which is what is going to be the population, which is going to be there, what is going to be the road densities, which is going to be there. So what should be the road length, which is going to be there, what is going to be the road width is going to be there. So those all things is all analyzed through big data. Now, uh, Rostam in Netherlands is the first smart city which is using this big data in developing their smart city and making policies and other thing conditions uh, related to big data. So we also have to know that how this big data is helping us in shaping our cities, shaping our design, knowing our requirement and knowing our operational capabilities of uh, now uh, doing uh, managing our buildings. Next is after you've got so much of data, you've worked on so much of data, the basic thing is what is there is BIM. CAD used to help people to draw. Now BIM help people to basically construct. BIM is not CAD. Now people have this myth of, okay, BIM is a software. No, BIM is not a software, it's just a tool. It's a, just a process. BIM was never meant to be CAD. CAD is a replacement for basically pen and picture, uh, pen and paper. And it's a basically a documentational tool which is available to us. In comparison, BIM is a program or a process or design application in which documentation flows from derivative of process. That means I make one solution, I make one BIM uh, model. That BIM model is used or can be shared and can be worked upon simultaneously by different stakeholders. Let me tell you that like um, you know, drawings we used to make in AutoCAD that used to be DWG format. Okay, so in basically BIM, it's nothing. It's just a simple thing of basically we are having our file or 3D model, which is an IFC mod, uh, foundation class. That means international foundation class. So that is the, that helps us in interpolating that 3D model can be used in, in case I've got any model, 3D model, which is prepared in BIM, it is transferred, uh, is prepared in Revit, and that BIM model is saved as in IFC format. So that same BIM model can be used by a person who's working in Tequila software in for the steel construction in Aircom company. So there he can just pick up that uh, BIM model and can just start working on it. And simultaneously, Whatever changes is going to make in that BIM model is going to be reflected in, in that IFC. And that is also being shared by all the stakeholders. Okay, so this is how the changes or revolution which has taken place if you start working in BIM. And a lot of people, a lot of architects are still not aware of this. And we don't also even teach this in our schools, in, in, so, sorry, in our institutes and um, uh, in our colleges. So it has got basically this BIM model, which is there has got the seven dimensions. First dimension is 3D BIM. 3D BIM is nothing. It is just a model. It is just a model which is made out of in a rivet, which has got dimension class, which has got balls, windows, everything. Those parameters are all assigned to that 3D model. Now you move to 4D model. 4D model is something where you start attaching parameters basically to that BIM model about the, uh, uh, about the scheduling of the project. Also the quantities which is to be completed for that scheduling and that particular time. So that means 3D is just a simple model where all parameters and all is given. 4D is where you have in that same BIM model, you have attached basically your, basically your scheduling and time when it is going to be done and resources which is required to be available for constructing that particular schedule at that particular time. Then you move to 5D BIM. 5D BIM is nothing to this 4D model, you would start attaching the cost factor to it. So moment you start att attaching the cost factor to this also, so then that becomes, it's more used by your surveyors and other things. So that becomes your 5D BIM model damage. Okay, 
Now to this 5D BIM model, model dimension, if you start adding your sustainability factors to it, like as to how much is going to be water consumption, what is going to be heat loss, where the thermal comfort or the ventilation is going to be there properly or not. So those things, if you start relating with this BIM model, start evaluating that in your software, open studio software or Ecotech or other uh, software, which is used basically for your lead rating or for your GRIA rating and other things, those things have to be dovetailed right there at 3D. BIM dimension. After uh, 6D, you come to 7D. 7D is where to that same BIM model which you have made, you start attaching information related to what is required for your, uh, your facility managers later on to operate because you are going to construct, operate, uh, you're, you're going to design, you construct and operate also. So that is where your 3D, your 7D comes into play. And that is later on, once the building is constructed, that model is shared with your facility manager and with user. And so that he comes to know, okay, when the firefighting uh, tanks have to be flushed, when the servicing for the lifts have to be done, when the, when the glass has to be cleaned, and when the basically other things related to managing or operating that building or where once the uh, filters for the uh, your uh, your cleaners have to be done hvac things have to be done those kinds of information is if it is attached to that bim model then that becomes your seven dimension so these are the dimensions which is there for the bim okay now we come to know to these dimensions how do you attach data you attach data to the level that is, you have this levels, you have this LOD 100, that you have this level of detail 100, level of detail 200, level of detail 300, level of detail 400, level of detail 500, level of detail 100 is just a construction. Now, this level of detail is also split up into two forms, which is known as LOI and LOG. LOI is your level of information. That is whatever information you're going to feed in. Okay, that is the quantities and other, all the text related things and other things are all related to LOI. And LOG is level of graphing is what is the 3D model or the model where the 3D thing is there is all given up in LOG. Okay, so the LOG, uh, LOD 100 is basically what is there you in your conceptual stage. Like you see at 100, it's only got those basically pillar, square pillar. Now, if you move to uh, LOD 200, to 200 is where you have thought, okay, this pillar, which is going to be there is your I section. Okay, so that is where you, it's a design model, which is coming in. Now, if you go to 300, then it will give you, okay, this I section from this pamphlet for this size and everything related to construction for that particular project is all information. If is that included in that uh, model, then that becomes your LO 300. LO 300 and LO 350 is what is basically related to your making contracting and other thing data. And LO 400 is what is you give to your fabricator where the all information related to, okay, I'm going to have this, uh, it's going to have this uh, uh, base plate, it's going to have these many bolts and these many lengths and this is what is available. So the, whatever information I have to give to my uh, uh, fabricator is what is basically LOD 400. And LOD 500 is later, which is the last one, which you give it the model, which you give it an accurate model as built model, which is what is constructed is what is known as LOD, uh, LOD 500. That means you started with level of detailing at 100 and you finish with your built up model, which is LOD 500. So this is what is basically what is BIMS. That means you have got, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not a software, it's a, just a process and it's got different dimensions. And it's got in that model, it's got different level of detailing, which is available for all of us to use in, uh, in our basically design process. Okay, after we understand BIM, let's see what is, now I've got the solution, I've got at build. Now, can I also make another concept which is coming is the 3D printing. That is the 3D printing is nothing like you normally do your printing. 
you do your printing, you do use ink, instead of ink in this printer, you're using basically concrete. You're using concrete or even you're using mud and other things. So the first 3D printing thing which has come up is basically, uh, is there in IIT Chennai down south. They've made this house uh, which is there and even this LAT, uh, LNT project which is there in Kanchipuram, I think somewhere they've made this uh, construction. And on the further, what happens is this helps us to have this does, does not allow us to do any wastages. This minimizes wastages if I start using 3D printing. Right now, at our stage, we can make our product in grasshopper. So I made it. Now that grasshopper product, once I put it to fabrication in this uh, 3D printing machine. So there the file size is basically dot uh, STL is what is going to be required. So that file is basically now is fed to the 3D printer and you start getting this uh, machine and you start making the prototype. They, like we had, uh, like in, at SSA, we got this 3D printer where they make the uh, students make the product in grasshoppers and then they feed it through this 3D printer and then they through plastics and all to one media. I mean, right now, this is at this stage where only one media is being used a medium is what is being used in for the 3d printing now the it's just like a black and white printer now the moment so much of development is taking place the like time will come and it's going to be color printer where rbg is where uh, at one time you will be using two three materials can be used simultaneously for doing 3d printing so the work and research work is going on for in that direction also and also that material thing is also coming in that material is developing fast material is now becoming responsive to climate it is expanding and contracting these are the things which is also being used in this 3d printers okay so this is what is there and we all should be aware of this and india in india this technology has come up and we have to know this also and can be used in our products and design and this will help us in make now these 3d printers can also be used at industry at a factory scale those modular design can be made by the 3d printer and then it can be transported to the site and can be erected there or can also be used like we use slip form shuttering same way you can have this 3d printer going up and down and we can make a tower out of it so that means this is what is the avenues and uh, things which is available to us we can use it we must be innovative enough to use this in our projects okay now after we know we have done 3D printing. Let's see what is the emerging technology, which is another happening. Okay, a second. I'll just uh, show you this in case, sorry. It cannot open. I'll just show you this, how the robotic, can you see this? Hi, and welcome to Cool Gadgets and Stuff. A construction 3D printer is a machine can you all that can see this this? by depositing a material yes, like sir. concrete layer by layer. Construction 3D printing saves time, uses less material, and so requires another peculiarity which I've seen in this in is this video, 3D printing going is to just like a hollow kind of a thing. That means it helps us in the projects from the last couple of years. So this is how it's not solid. It's hollow kind of a thing. Apis Core is developing a 3D printer that can print houses and even entire buildings. The company says building homes with the bot is more efficient and less expensive than relying on humans. A building of any size can be printed just by moving the printer around. The footage you're seeing is from a pilot project for a municipal building in Dubai. Apis Core can print the walls of a standard home in just two to three days, while traditional methods will take about a month to complete. Right now, it can only print walls. Roofs, floors, foundation, electrical systems, and plumbing are all done by traditional methods. It also makes it possible to reduce the used materials, tools, and waste during the construction process. Currently, it is only suited for low-rise buildings, but the plans are to develop it to enable printing of high-rise construction, as well as foundations, floors, and roofing. First generation natural material mix made from soil taken from the this surrounding is what we also did and waste one materials of the from agricultural the, industries uh, such as future straw in SSA, and rice there, there, they'd made, we The saw mixture this, is layered using a 3D printer made this thing from the mud. The screen, creating walls with vertical cavities inside, which are filled with rice husks for insulation. The building's walls have been designed with complex geometrical features 
with the aim of embedding natural ventilation and thermoacoustic systems that are difficult to replicate with traditional construction. The house is high energy performing and does not need heating or air conditioning as it maintains a mild and comfortable temperature inside both in winter and summer. It took 10 days to create the outer shell with a wall thickness of 40 centimeters or 15 inches and a total material cost of about $1,000. Researching in the field of construction 3D printing and has made the first 3D printed building in Europe. The BOD or Building on Demand is demonstrating the feasibility of 3D printing a building. Stacking layers of extruded tubes on top of one another results in the sausage wall appearance, which then requires post-processing to smooth out the walls to prepare for plastering. To solve this problem, the BOD2 team has devised an ingenious flap that shapes the extrusion to have vertically flat sides. So that means With BOD2, the building process now is these automated, vendors are also and the orders irritating. of what can they're, be they're achieved knowing, are still to be explored. the limitations and then doing changes accordingly, doing adjustments. Maxi Printer, developed by French company Constructions 3D, is a turnkey solution for concrete 3D printing on site. This large-scale 3D printer is capable of creating innovative habitats very quickly and at low cost. Developed for this machine, it will allow you to configure your files simply. No, no, this is another robotic thing which is done, like, which like reacts to wind, blocks. vibration, and other environmental factors in instantly, 3D printing, enabling the precise positioning of objects. You, you make walls it's capable and all. of laying up to a thousand bricks an hour, about the output of two human bricklayers for a day, with no need for breaks. Hadrian X builds faster more accurately and with less construction waste, which equates to savings for builders and home buyers. Hadrian X is not commercially available yet. Very concrete mix, which the company dubbed Lavacrete. This proprietary cement-based formula, which is specific to climate and... Okay, so this is how, if you see, this is how People are evolving all around the world. 3D printers are being used. And how even different materials like concrete, mud, and husk you know, can, can be used in our uh, projects. And even the robotics making those walls and all are, uh, is being used. Okay. Now we'll, I'll come to next one, which is the last one. That is immersive technology. Now, let me be very clear that there is a lot of confusion which happens in our mind as to what is virtual reality, what is augmented reality, and what is mixed reality. Virtual reality is what you all do, like doing gaming exercises, where everything is in virtual world. Your 3D model, everything is made up of or in, in the virtual world. And there only, you from there, through your... Basically, your tools and all, you go inside the project and you can just see and uh, uh, do adjustment and see what all is there and you can uh, change the spaces. Whereas augmented reality is what is in between. That means where on the mixed, that is at the, at the real site conditions, in case you have your tablet or tableau, I'll show you with the basically that uh, video is also available to me then it'll be more clear that means in case i've got uh, basically 2d plan if you see at a bottom right if you see there i've got this 2d plan of a house and and if i put the same thing on that tabular and i've got this eclair software which is available to me uh, there if i install that in my tabular uh, in my uh, ipad then I'll be able to see the 3D machine of that, uh, 3D of that uh, 2D project. But uh, nothing, it's nothing that for the 2D uh, printout, which is there, I've already got that BIM model stored with me. So that BIM model is the one which is being projected. Similarly, if you go towards, if you see the same thing is also being used by this IKEA company to uh, to doing the sale management. Then what they do is they see, okay, they've got this iPad, they've got this iPhones, and that is projected towards the basically the space where they want to have the, any sofa set and all. So with a click of button, you get the same kind of a sofa set if it is placed in that location, how it's going to look is what has been shown. So that this is where you've got augmented reality. 
reality. That means some you add a mixed environment, you are bringing a virtual object to that mixed environment. Okay, like the same thing can also be used at site to know, okay, any piping work or anything, if there, there's any conflict which is happening at site through this iPads or through this uh, tablet, you can just see as to what is happening behind that wall construction and what all is happening there can all be known to uh, the workers who are working on site. So that is where is known as augmented reality. And your mixed reality is the one which is one step ahead. It's just like hologram and all. Where you're, you're wearing, there you have to wear basically your uh, Google, uh, 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 your goggles or Microsoft uh, uh, holograms uh, has to be uh, uh, worn. And then through that only, in the mixed reality, that whole hologram comes into play. Like you see down below, from there, you are seeing the Spider-Man coming out of it. So that is a hologram which is coming out of it. Or similarly, if you see down below, a person who is just uh, wearing that um, uh, Microsoft um, uh, hologram, he is able to see a bicycle which is there in front of him and he can just make changes in that bicycle through that hologram or that virtual model that that virtual model changes whereas in augmented reality the virtual model is just brought into it and there is no changes and all can be done in that whereas in mixed reality that hologram which comes though the virtual model which comes can be changed and uh, the whole thing can be basically the hologram um, uh, there uh, is can be changed and is seen by all if i I am also wearing, uh, I, I've just got a building in front of me and other person is also wearing a hologram. Whatever changes I do in that building and will also be visible to person who's standing uh, at the other side wearing the those Google glasses. So that is what is known as mixed reality. So I'll just show you with the, this thing, how with this Eclore software, which is a very simple software, This is how with still with the uh, this VR and AR and it's only with this also with your client also you can go inside the virtual model you can show him your solutions and options and then can make changes. So that's all. That means there, there's still more. Like there was, I, I think I would, I would have carried on with your metaverse and other thing, which is the latest thing which is now happening. Where uh, let me just tell you that also, this metaverse is basically nothing like you must have seen or heard it that these people are just fighting for this basically your spaces or the virtual uh, spaces which has been created. Now uh, Barbados has already basically given us, given them, uh, asked for the land for their embassy to be constructed there. These are all virtual lands. Like what happens is a bit money. It's all virtual thing which is happening. Same way they're going to have this property and land, which is going to be the virtual land is going to be there. And suppose I want to go towards Goa. So they will be, uh, okay, uh, there I want to have a casino there. So the, all that casino and all will be constructed virtually there. And you will be taken up to that place through the virtual model for you to do their further activity. So this is how your, uh, it's all mind boggling, boggling thing is there. So those things, in case you're not abreast with it right now, you will just lag behind and become obsolete. So that is what I mean to say is that uh, we should also be ready to learn. That's why I say always my last slide is this only. Journey continues, we are still learning. There are certain things which are happening all around and we have to be abreast with what is happening all around. So that is how at last I end my lecture here. In case you have anything.
uh, any questions, anything to shoot, I'll be able to answer that. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So, uh, participants, if you have any questions, please uh, type it in a chat box or you can unmute and you can ask. Mm -hmm. Or you can also write it. I've got my email ID. You can just mail it to me also later on. Sure, sir. Because what I mean to say is we have to be abreast with technology. We can't be insulated. We can't be working like a, like an ostrich in our own world. And we don't know what is happening all around. So we have to move on with changes. Hello. Uh, um, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. This is Shamant, the uh, architect here. Uh, actually, the presentation was uh, such an immersive one. You had opened our eyes. And somewhere in the middle of the presentation, we felt that we'll be nowhere in the future, right? Uh, with the uh, technologies which has come up. So uh, I really uh, appreciate the amount of effort you had put. Everything was going in a flow where you had explained us right from the beginning till the virtual uh, technology, which was a very good experience. My uh, question with you is like, see, all yes, getting being abreast with the technology is always the best uh, thing, which is which is which should be. And your end slide is the most inspiring and motivating. Looking at your experience looking at your enthusiasm and what you say still you are still learning that inspires us a lot that is uh, more than what is required for us in this session to get inspired so my question is my question is looking at this present practice what present practices what we have in india right now uh, to be very practical uh, like if i go to a client right if i go to a client when i use all these softwares Okay, a bit out of context question to you, but as you are in a field uh, for so many years, maybe you can highlight something at a practical front, at it at an educational uh, front also. First, first part of the question is with the uh, practice part of it, right? When I get a project to do, the amount of software I put, the amount of effort I put, right? Traditional practice, you don't get that amount of fees from a client. I worked with a great Hafiz contractor and uh, coordinated with SNP also for an Amravati capital city. Now, the, the amount of fees, what they get for the projects is, right? Where the 3D, every at every stage of the presentation, they get a 3D model. Which definitely, yes, uh, it's not like we are not abreast with the software, but the scope what we had, when I joined as an architect, I had been working in this field for 18 years. When I joined as an architect, for us, getting an AutoCAD uh, authorized software itself was a big challenge. Uh -huh, got it. Yeah. Right. So, uh, we used to do unauthorized software and all this stuff used to happen. But today's present situation, I don't expect an answer from you. Look, I'm just trying to put up the situation. I know I'm asking you a question which is out of your purview also. But through your experience, can we find some mid, midway where we can do, we can be uh, abreast with the technology at the same time we can cope up. So I'll come to that part. So the first question is the amount of fees what we get from the client. For the uh, technology, what we use for the softwares which are get charged. It, even today, uh, the one which we are saying outdated, not a cat perpetual, right? Mm. Not it's out of scope for us to buy because the amount of fees I get for a project and the amount of uh, what is required for a software it goes on. It goes on for the toss. Is first part of it. Yes, uh, we do believe that whatever comes from other land is always the beautiful part of it, right? So they have been paid also that much to involve into this. Now coming to the academic one, right? Now uh, going with the regular subjects, everything is taking us time. So the, did uh, when I was going through a presentation, I was just uh, just thinking about can there be sessions like this where you get an academic platform to explore the softwares, right? Not all students might be interested in learning the software, or not all the faculty would be interested. But if there is a cell, a software. Uh, technology cell which uh, takes up the uh, software at an academic at an institute level where all the institutes get collaborated and then uh, give these softwares uh, make these softwares available for students to learn the, uh, is there any uh, anything of that sort in, uh, 
uh, an operation which is made at an academic level okay i'll tell you the first uh, the second part first that means since i am in academic field and all because you must have seen that uh, nep has come up so nep what their na national education policy has come up there so there they are propagating uh, that we have to go towards a virtual kind of a thing that online mode has to be more that means 20% of what we teach like uh, i have also made one there's i made one suggestive model as to how we can incorporate these technologies unfortunately was slide many huh? i have not put in because it was not uh, related to academic it was only related to basically a professional uh, kind of a thing i was addressing that so there i have uh, i have given a suggestive model that from second year or first year level how you can start putting in these incorporating these software in the in the academic field so that students are aware of it like i have already told you that trezy caprion these are the people who and ratlab they, they, they are the one in indians and they are the one who are helping us in collaborate plus another thing which is happening nowadays is we are all moving slowly with this online mode and other thing coming in we are all moving towards a online platform now the, 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 the time is not short when there is going to be virtual virtual universities that means i will be having recording my lectures no we also do it right now we record our lectures and we pass it on to uh, basically students and they also uh, participate in it so all that lecture is recorded now this thing is also recorded now this recording thing comes to us uh, uh, it helps us later on to basically uh, uh, generate more uh, uh, content or out of it so what is happening is that nep they are encouraging us to go on online mode and they have said okay out of this you have core courses you have discipline courses you have your uh, ability enhancement courses in that ability enhancement courses your skill enhancement courses 20% of that credit has to be through these courses so they are formulating policies as to where these software and all can be taught through it so i may be at shushant i may be, i may want to uh, uh, may, maybe latika is there at uh, uh, dhyanand she is uh, teaching one software so my students can participate that 20% credit which is there can be used by students there so that comes as a academic credit bank so those credit is given to the students so we are in academia we are moving towards that direction where all this software things and other lectures and other things can be seen and another another factor is also i wanted you to take a lead in your first part of question where they have spelled out in the professional field this much is what is the minimum fees which is required to be done but nobody is implementing that because our profession is something right. in which because what is if if i am a lawyer to me fas gaya i have to pay that fees if i am a doctor i am at last point i am going i have to pay that fees whereas in architecture profession everybody user itself is we have to do what the user want so everything depends upon him so that coa has to be more effective in that in implementing and getting us that uh, basically uh, slab which they have already fixed so we ourselves are responsible for this as a community that we accept there is something known as l1 we start accepting that l1 we go down to that level and that's why because there is a lot of competition which is there so this is what is happening so that should be stopped somewhere ceo has to come up with these regulations and for the second part also they also have to make a bank like they have got this coa trc bhopal so they can make a bank and they can have their lectures and all recorded there and any university from any students can join and can do that and it's going to be like byju kind of a thing payment through payment you can just learn these things and can enhance your knowledge so this is what is my only suggestion which is that in case we have to move towards that yeah because looking at the uh, presentation i'm really uh, motivated seeing it happening hope uh, we get that but the uh, one more question added to it sir for us in india if you look at the practices in india maybe for corporate offices uh, when you compare with the uh, traditional conventional uh, construction or matlab i tell you my experience of uh, pre cast construction and uh, on site uh, construction uh we we have done cost analysis for both of it like to everything boils down to, to us is cost right so when these sort of technologies come into picture there's amount of the amount of cost per square feet also increases right how do you how do you really uh, look into that challenge because like corporate offices like infosys or uh, wipro when we were working right they were also very much involved into uh, uh, 
cost of construction, right? The challenge is what it has. Nee, wo, wo, that is what I'm saying. Na. I don't know whether you just go, go, go to the site of BMTPC. So there, their government has also taken up this challenge. Of those six technologies, they have done, basically, they have identified the vendors. They have tried to... So everything, it's it all depends upon economy of scale. If you have these more and more vendors available to us for these, these, these technology, then the automatically cost thing will come down. So that is what government is also trying to do it at uh, their level, that they are uh, constructing a lot of houses with these technologies so that this technology is freely available. So automatically the cost of these precast and this thing will come down the moment you have more number of demand. It's all a question of demand and supply kind of a thing. So this can only happen, start happening from government level then we'll come down to private chip players and that too with MNCs and other things moving into it. Then only the cost factor will come down. It's all economy of scale which has to be done. Correct. Correct. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. So uh, one more question is there from uh, Mr. N. Uh, Tangong. So he's asking, as we are approaching towards technology advancement in, in the learning, do you feel there is a need to change our academic curriculum and the feeling uh, that the gap from the current standard of education to a futuristic one? So uh, he's asking- Definitely, definitely. Oh, definitely, that is what I said right in the beginning. Definitely, we have to change. We have to move towards what is the requirement of the industry and what is required out of us. That's why I don't know whether you people are aware that we have got board of studies. So every five, every year they do revisions on their curriculum and they make changes. It's only AICTC at their level or CUA at their level give us a framework. Okay, this is what is going to be taught for this five years. No, there, whatever, as per the university level, we can make changes in that BOS and in that board of studies and academic council, we can, and we incorporate people from industry to come up and give us solutions to that. And we start using that like, in our Shushan, we have started using this 3D printer kind of a thing, parametric design, those things, and BIM things. We have started teaching them modular precast things. We have started teaching. So that initiative has to come from the university level only. So in that board of studies, you can just make changes. Only the I'll just also request through this media, COA to come up with a framework based on the new education policy, the new curriculum, and those credit systems can all have to be revised. Now they have come up with another thing, which is known as exit policy. That is for every, like, uh, like I, I don't know whether you people are aware that uh, in, the, in, in the policy they've come up, okay, if I do a first year course, then I'll be given a certification for this. If I do a second year till that course, BR course, I'll be given a diploma. If I go for third year course, I'll be given basically your uh, uh, some past degree. Fourth year, it'll be something honors like that. And then PG level. So like that, they've, they've come up. So through that, we are also as in institution, as academia, we are also changing our curriculum regularly. And we are supposed to revise that uh, curriculum every five years so that we have abreast with the technology. Technology. So this is what is supposed to be done and is happening in some places and should be done across the board. That is what is my only uh, plea. I hope I have answered your question. Sorry, I'm not, not able to hear. We cannot hear you, Anashruti, ma'am. Can you hear me, sir, now? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so, thank you, sir, for the detailed uh, info which you shared with us. Very informative session. So on behalf of uh, School of Architecture, the Anand Sagar Academy of Technology and Management, I, architect Anushruti, take this opportunity to uh, convey a vote of thanks to our today's session one speaker, Professor uh, Virendra Kumar Malik. So thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation and took out time from your busy schedule. 
and i'm really thankful to you for briefing mm -hmm. us about automation in architecture and uh, futuristic emerging trends especially in the construction industry and it will be definitely helpful for us to adopt digital approach in architecture and it will lead uh, lead to a new era in architecture and a construction industry so once again thank you so much sir for your uh, valuable time and uh, uh, sharing and eye opener session with all of us thank you thank you sir thank you so much thank uh, thank you ma'am i am highly obliged and in case you still anybody has got still any questions and anything want to connect with me my email id is there and sure, my sure, phone number sir. is also there so sure, you can sure. just contact I'll, thank you ma'am sure, thank you once again thank, thank you thank you so much sir anusthiti ma'am Yes. Uh, will we be? Uh, will you be sharing the presentations and the uh, recordings to? Yes, yes, sir. We'll do it, sir. We'll let you know to which connect you have to do. You will be be able to access. It. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Viren sir. Uh, now we would like to invite uh, Dr. Deepika Shetty, our day three session two speaker. Uh, there's a brief introduction about her. Dr. Deepika Shetty is presently professor in Manipal School of Architecture and Planning, Mahe, and was director from 2018 to 21 in Mahe, Manipal. She had completed her B.R. in 1998 from Mumbai and Masters in Urban Design. In 2001, from SEPT Ahmedabad, and her PhD from Mahe in 2015. She has teaching experience of 22 years in Manipal and has worked as consultant for government projects related to Comprehensive Development Plan of UDP 2005, assessment of vulnerable the vulnerability of coastal area CRZ of UDP District 2012. She also has been part of Vision 2025 in 2017. She is a member of panel of advisors. For UDP District Coastal Zone Management Plan since 2013. She gave a model spatial development plan for two gram panchayats and was in panel of advisor for updating RA, RADP FI guidelines of Ministry of Panchayat Raj, Government of India in 2020. She has published papers in the field of morphology of towns in coastal Karnataka, traditional burnt houses of UDP, sustainable development, etc. Her expertise lies in the development, developing sustainable models of habitat development, combining traditional knowledge systems and sustainable practices for both urban and rural developments of architecture, urban design, town planning, and regional development. She has guided more than 50 theses in BR and 20 post-graduation theses. Ma'am Deepika, ma we welcome you. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and uh, over to you, ma'am. you i think uh, first uh, i should thank for the opportunity and i enjoyed uh, professor virendra's lecture also it was nice uh, and it's a nice uh, good group of people whom we are uh, able to share our knowledge and learn from it so i would request all of you to uh, put your questions as and when you think of during my presentation in the chat box so that you don't forget the questions and i think we can have a good discussion at the end of the session. So I'll start sharing my screen. Yes, ma'am, you can. So is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Just make it full screen. Yeah. yeah. I'll remove my Ma'am, we are not able to hear you. Deepika, ma'am. One second. Uh, 
now is it yes ma'am ma'am we are not able to hear you Deepika, ma'am, we are not able to hear you. Okay, one second. I think uh, there's some problem in the setting. Okay, uh, just check now. Yeah, we are able to hear you, ma'am. Hello, again. Hello. Yeah, you could hear right now. Yeah, now you are audible. No, the thing is, I've recorded uh, my audio in the file itself. So are you able no. to hear the recording no. or only no, whatever no, we, you're speaking? No, now? only whatever you're speaking, we are able to hear you. Not, not the recording which is there no, no. in the uh, presentation because I wanted it exactly uh, one hour. So I uh, did a recording. Uh, so that's why no, I, I record we are not able to hear. Okay. Ma'am, while sharing the screen, there is at bottom left side, there's something known as allow video, allow audio. Audio. So you, check, okay. uh, you check that button, then only it will come. Okay, kind. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for this. <laughs> okay, now I'll start playing. How to develop? Yeah, we are able to hear, ma'am. Yeah, okay. One thing which I have done here is built a system for understanding the place. Uh, coincidentally, this structure, I started uh, doing it in SEP when I was doing my master's. Uh, under my professor Rameshwar, I wrote a paper for urban design theory, which was based on how to develop the principles of art and creation as per Rasa Shastra. And there I realized that the context is a very important step for any creation of art as per Rasa Shastra. And I think in architecture also, it is very true that context is very important. And then based on uh, the definition of the various slides not terms moving. used in Rasa Shastra, I developed a system for architecture and urban design on how to define your context and how to develop your design uh, as per the terms or uh, philosophies of Rasa Shastra. And I'm linking my study of parkour and heritage to that structure which I had worked on. It comes together very well. So in terms of sustainability, uh, the process of sustainability if you go to the essence of it, it truly means belongs to the land, belongs to the nature, belongs to the environment. If you design such a way, then it is sustainable. So how do you define context is very important step towards defining sustainability. So I call this four pillars of sustainability, but it is same as defining or understanding context. So the first step is Shetra. Shetra I define as the nature, what is given to you, which you cannot change, or you have to accept it as something that you have to work with or respect. Without that, you will do wrong in design, or you will go wrong in design. So this is about uh, nature, climate, landscape, soil, hydrology, geology, uh, whatever comes from nature and its setting is the Shetra. 
in ancient terms you have already always heard no um, that uh, kashi kshetra or different kshetras uh, they normally call it spiritual but if you look closely they are geographical zones sharing common features similarly our region uh, is known as parashurama kshetra uh, right from kerala to this coastal karnataka comes under parashurama kshetra and the reason it's known as one kshetra is because the story goes that it was um, taken from the sea so uh, reclaimed from the sea now uh, so this has this feature of western ghats on one end so it goes around 1000 meters uh, above sea level and then within 10 kilometers reaches zero so if you put a slope uh, analysis it's almost a uh, 10% slope which is quite steep in its characteristics and it has a uh, tropical climate or uh, uh, and uh, this means it has a lot of rainfall uh, red, red, rich red soil uh hilly terrain um coastal area close to sea having mountainous region now this setting allows it to hold a lot of biodiversity the Re reason i'm elaborating on the kshetra is this is something that is given to you you cannot change and you have to respect it to develop any kind of design idea okay the second is loka that is the social paradigm this is something which i think is very uh beautiful because it is something that has evolved through history evolved through generation of cultural development of the region and this is something that actually defines the identity of a place which we as designers should not do anything to conflict it but rather enhance it or redefine it in our own beautiful way so this is called, uh, like i would say would be and shri krishna temple have close associations the cuisine which has come from this region has close associations various practices rituals uh, even uh, costumes designs which has evolved over time belongs to this region all this has to be imbibed absorbed respected before i venture into any design not because of any partiality or inclination but more because it is ingrained into the tradition of this place and um, it has become an identity first thing whenever pe people talk of udupi there will be of two reasons one is the cuisine and other is shri krishna temple or the dwaitya philosophy which originated from here and uh, also the coast the beaches uh, all this has become the identity of udupi and has to be respected uh and third is defined by the man made creations or conditions uh which i say as development of architecture development of styles uh development of the physical infrastructure like road and systems and facilities uh so we have different types of infrastructure which has evolved over time we need to respect it understand it and then work with it so that the strengths are enhanced and the weaknesses are overcome but this is more flexible uh in the sense like uh, infrastructure always undergoes transformation as per the uh, need of the time so one is uh, like we say uh, use the infrastructure to the maximum extent whatever is there Uh, recycle whatever is uh, strong but is not being used to its efficiency and of course demolish which has become weak and has become irrelevant so this goes for the third step that is uh, the desha or the man made conditions the fourth and it is again a very important layer which we designers may not really uh, consider important for sustainability but i think it's very Uh, important for sustainability is the kala kala is kind of a uh, the trend or the way in which the present is defining its future and this doesn't happen with the designer alone defining the future of a place but the people of the place defining the future 
Now, why I say this is very important for sustainability, whatever we designers do will not be successful without the participation of people, without including the aspirations of people, without consulting the knowledge or incorporating the knowledge of the people. So the Kala is actually the time, the way in which the people live and they want to live in future the trends that are happening world over, the best practices, and how they can all come together in a very harmonious manner. The fourth layer actually defines the future, which you want to shape along with the people of the place. So it is also a context. It is also the present and the past, but it is actually done to define the future. So these are the four layers which I find very crucial to defining what is sustainable design. And now I'll be in the same way. So if you want to understand the Kshetra, it belongs, I think you can see the map. It's in Karnataka, coastal Karnataka. It's uh, south of Goa. And uh, there is a district called Udpi district in which we have a town called Udpi which is having 96 kilometers of coastline and has 10 kilometers width and uh, 45 kilometers uh, in terms of the broadest area. Five rivers flowing through it. So you can imagine that every two kilometers you will come across a tributary or a river. So water body and land comes in uh, like a sandwich manner, water, land, water, land, water, that way. The whole district is shaped like that. So none of the rivers are very ferocious. They are smaller in width and uh, gentle and perennial. And uh, the it originates from the Western Ghats and meets the sea, uh, Arabian Sea in the West Coast. Uh, the temperature varies from almost 18 degrees to uh, 35 degrees um, and summers are hot. There's nothing called winter here. It's hot and humid climate. It rains uh, four months very heavily and eight months a year almost with slight showers included. Uh, it gets up to 4,000 mm of rainfall, which is a lot of rain, a lot of thunder and lightning. rainfall And it's not uh, very easy because sometimes the current goes. Uh, sometimes you you should not be outdoors because it has a lot of windy torrential rains, a lot of black clouds. Sometimes it rains continuously for days together where you don't have a dry spell at all. Uh, so that is the kind of uh, rains we have. The uh, humidity during, of course, rainy season is almost 100%. So you are very uh, sweaty and sticky all the time. And the lowest uh, humidity you have is 75%. It's basically a very humid climate throughout the year. So this is to make you understand the climate, climate temperature, uh, rain, and summer. Summer is very hot, humid, goes up to 35, 36. The temperature may not sound very high, but with the humidity, it becomes quite uncomfortable. Uh, the hydrogeology, if you look at it, uh, you will see that, of course, the coastal has the elevated soil, and then you have the partial granite, igneous rocks, and uh, red soil, and the hilly terrain. Now, one thing good about the hills is it's about strong rocks. It's not the uh, sedimentary soil as in the Himalayas, because that makes it very easy to chip off. Comparatively, these are more sturdy uh, hills. At the same time, it doesn't mean that landslides won't occur. It's not singular lo uh, rocks. They, they are just uh, pieces of rocks. So actually, to hold the soil, you need huge, big trees. Like I said, the slope is uh, quite steep. So uh, uh, the idea is, if you have this kind of terrain and this type of tropical climate, the best thing you can do is have forests. So I'd say that the indigenous landscape of this region is thick dense forest. It was very well known for teak. That's why wooden architecture of the olden times is very beautiful. 
and you could stick forests. Some of them so dense that uh, sunlight doesn't enter even during daytime. Lot of varieties of indigenous trees. I think Western Ghats is known for uh, highest biodiversity in terms of flora and fauna. A uh, lot of um, what you call it snails and uh, smaller insect uh, um, uh, variety are maximum here. The number of trees, I think, is still not documented completely in this region. So uh, this is just to say that there is this, um, if you see, there is this forest area now, what that is foothills of Western Ghats, and the midland is now used for horticulture and agriculture, and then there is the coastal belt, which is full of beaches and elevators, so, and, and the uh, terrain is not so steep. Okay. So, if you see the loka, that is the tradition, the culture, most of it is linked to the uh, climatic cycle, the moon cycle, the sun cycles, and uh, the agricultural practice. So the whole set of festivals starts with when you start sowing, when you start plowing, when you harvest, when does the uh, rain start, when, when does the rain end, when does the spring start, when does the spring end, when does the uh, hot uh, winter climate with light showers start, and how does it end? And many of the rituals and its practices are closely associated with the local produce. We like from the decoration to the uh, uh, designs are closely linked to the natural flora fauna. In fact, uh, I didn't show you here the Buta Kola. The whole dress costume comes from the arachnid produce. The decoration that you see here in Puja is completely made with banana stem. Uh, banana leaf, uh, flowers from this region, uh, uh, coconut uh, produce its uh, uh, flowers, arachnid produce, arachnid flowers. So the whole uh, ritual is closely linked to the land, closely linked to the produce, and every festival ritual, even in terms of food, there are certain uh, items made at certain uh, seasons as per the produce, and uh, in terms of spatially linking it, it would be Temple Square is the place where you'll get all the ingredients uh, to do those rituals. That means all the produce of that season will be available in would be Temple Square. All the uh, cooking utensils required for those particular preparations will be uh, available in would be Temple Square. All the decorations required uh, to do those kind of rituals will be available. So that way the space, the architecture, the rituals, the tradition all come together. Now, uh, what I feel is why do we need to uh, thrive on these rituals is it keeps encouraging indigenous knowledge system, indigenous produce, and most of them are economic, eco-friendly eco or environment friendly. So uh, the ingredients used were uh, from nature. Uh, sadly, I don't like when they convert it into plastic. Some of them want to convert all these decorations into plastic, which is very sad, but it is happening everywhere. But still, quite a bit is still living. And this is all recent photographs. They are not old photographs. So it's not died completely. And these are uh, local god, extreme um, uh, to your left, what you see, are local gods. They will be associated with stories of heroes of this region who fought for the land, who fought for the people. Some of the gods are the fears of the people. Like there is a, a wild boar in the gods. That means there are a lot of wild boar attacks from the jungle to the agricultural land. And that it destroys the crop and the produce. So to overcome that fear of wild boar, you have a god who protects you from the wild. Similarly, all uh, there is a, a, a god goddess for female. That is, a lot of uh, deaths used to happen due to childbirth. So to protect you from death of child and mother during childbirth, there is a god to protect you from that. So actually, these gods represent the region in terms of the heroes over the years, the fears or the the local. Uh, uh, issues of the region and stories which were built 
to deal with those issues, to deal with the regional uh, problems and facets. So I think that's how you have to appreciate. Many of times we say that these are all old or they don't make sense. It's not for you to make sense. Uh, it is not for you to acknowledge the sense. Actually, it makes sense to the people and that's why it's important. It is relevant to the people and that's why it's important. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or you practice it or not. Uh, so whenever we design, we should not put our likes and dislikes in the forefront. We have to put the people's perception in the forefront. Okay. So next comes uh, the Kala. Uh, uh, I will get into the special part a little later. But many a times the uh, town which I'm discussing, uh, that is Barkur, uh, came from the principles of Vedic times which talks of a uh, town developed for around 100 to 5,000. So here they say that around 1,000 families were there. And uh, uh, they also make a distinction of hierarchy of uh, uh, what you call it, roads, the orientation, the systems. And each town was given a job, like town on the river or a bank. Was it for trade? Was it fortified? Was it for defense purpose? Was it a, a trade town or a capital town? Was it for purpose of just residential habit habitation for agriculture? So uh, uh, each town had a purpose and hence the design changed. So Barkur was a capital town, so it was designed. It was also a trading center before it became a capital. Uh, it has a history right from 2nd century AD. Uh, documented history. However, the uh, footprint has traces from 12th century to present. So it has a long history as a town development. Uh, now, Desha, that is what I said as the man made development. Uh, so, what is the importance today? What is the hierarchy today? What is its status today? And how would it work or function in the whole system of development? So Barkur today has become part of a village panchayat. It has lost its importance because the trading center has shifted to the coast. The political center from it being a capital has shifted to another town called Udupi, down south. So Barkur is north of Udupi, around 17 kilometers north of Udupi. And uh, uh, it is around 7 kilometers from the coast. So right now, the port and trading center, it was an inland port. I'll tell you the importance of inland port a little later. Uh, its population has reduced to just 5,000, half of, uh, in fact, quarter of what it was before. And of course, the kings are no more. And the economic center, that is the trade, is no more. So it's kind of lost its glory. But the physical trace of the town planning still works. And uh, irrespective of it flourishing or not having that density, this, it still supports a very nice uh, system of habitation. So if you want to just understand the landscape, you have this uh, river fronts, beach fronts development uh, right next to it with coconut trees, um, the degraded forest area where the this is actually um, what you say as uh, uh, the red stone, laterite stone, which is exposed here. You will find a lot of such formations or the granite stone. These are the two stones which are exposed if the soil has eroded. So you will see these outcrops in some places. Then you have a thin forest area in the habitation uh, where you have these huge trees uh, shading uh, some areas and then there are these agricultural lands uh, with uh, clusters of houses. Uh, in Unlike the north, here the, the farm and the house go together. It's not like all the houses of the village are in one place and the farm surrounding it. The owner likes to live with his property defined and the house right in the farm and then the next the distance between houses are more. If you see two, three houses, it may be related. That is brothers and sisters having house next to each other. But it's one family and then the property and then the next property and the next family. So there will be a lot of distance between the families. 
That's why you say South Indians are a little introverted. Even their habitat is defined by that kind of introverted. And now what you see is the view of Barkur. And uh, here you uh, will see that uh, this is a very strong center. And if I may uh, point out in the uh, photograph of the junction, you will see one flint like structure right in the corner with steps. And uh, it is known, it's a very interesting, uh, and in the map, it is uh, labeled as Kal Chapra, K L C H A P R A. And this simply translated means a uh, shelter of stone. Kal is stone, Chapra is shelter. Okay. Shelter simply means four columns and a roof. Okay. So even if you see the structure, that's all it has four columns and roof. There's no idol there, it's not a temple, it's a plinth and four. Uh, uh, why is it there? Now that's a very interesting um, uh, role. It actually defines the center of town, not just physically, but in terms of social uh, structure. Uh, each society has its own cluster in the town with its own deity. So if there is a community of uh, Bengal or uh, uh, what you call it, craftsmen, they will have their own deity of Vishwakarma uh, who are into arts. There is a, a cluster of musicians. Uh, they have Virabhadra as their deity. Uh, then there are a cluster of businessmen. Uh, again, they have their own deity. Uh, so like that, there are clusters. Now, each deity and temple has one day in a year dedicated for that temple. That is the festival of the temple or the deity. Now, that deity will travel from that temple to this point on that day. So, this place belongs to that deity on that day. And then it goes back. So, actually, this, does, this structure kind of gives unity to all the communities living in this region and says that this place belongs to you also. I think as a gesture, as an element of a town, it's such a beautiful meaning that each person in the town is associated it, with it at least for one day as it's theirs. And of course, rest of the year also it is theirs. But what it means is it, it does not uh, belong to any one deity or one community or one uh, place. Uh, so this is uh, central, not just because it's in this junction of the town, central junction of the town, but it is central for its practices also. And it's a beautiful carved, uh, I don't know if you the pictures of it, it has beautiful carvings. Okay, now when you're designing, you should have a central concept of development, which is normally called a bindu. Means it's the starting point, and it is the point which you want to make as the fundamental of the town. So if we see Barkur, what is its fundamental essence would be that it's a trading town in a capital town. It's an inland port, which was very important or critical to the land or the kingdom. Okay, next is Nabi. Nabi is set of things or centers which holds the town system together. And if I have to define Barkur and its centers, I would say it is that system of dividing the sectors of the town, each sector with its temple and a water tank. Now, that is very interesting. The water tank is very critical to that sector. In many ways, I will uh, explain it later. And chakra, that is how the whole thing uh, kind of sustains itself. How does it revive? And like you understand a settlement, what is a settlement? It's a place to live. When you want to live, what do you need? You need food, water, and all the facilities. So how is it distributed? How will it sustain? How will it not die? Is what is a system design. So that's the chakra. That's the cycle. Now here cycle is not just of one product or one thing. It's the systems of the town that keeps it going for so many years. So the reason I feel Barkur is an important lesson for this region is simply because it is a working system and it has not led to die. The, I mean, the town is not dead uh, because of the design. 
uh, whatever economic uh, decay, uh, I mean, decay has happened is because of the political decisions. But as a system of design, it is working very well for centuries. That means the design is good. It is sustainable and it is perfect for this region. That's for the test of time. Okay, uh, so next comes uh, the uh, maps. Like I was saying, this is the map of uh, Barkur, which I created myself for documentation. Uh, if you see the, the blue color, which I have used a bright blue to highlight it, there are actually 12 tanks. The other tanks are smaller. You will see four or five, which are huge. The one on the bottom left of you, uh, is the main tank or the center, uh, what you say, the temple dedicated for the town, kind of a, a god who looks after the town, called Panchalingeshwara, and the tank in front of it, uh, it doesn't belong to any one community, it belongs to the town. And rest of the tanks are belonging to different sectors of the town. So actually, if you see, there's north, south, east, west, big tanks, and rest of the tanks are smaller. There are actually 12 living tanks associated with temple in this town. This is what I'm defining as town is one kilometer radius. And remember in those days, town includes agriculture and horticulture. It includes different professions required. And uh, so that's what I uh, want to highlight here is that town is not just about having uh, facilities or so many population. Town is about what type of profession comes into place, how are they located, how will the system work, how will they live, how is the food produced. Now, today we are talking of urban agriculture, but in olden times, agriculture was part of town design. You have horticulture, only thing the sizes varied or the scale varied. Uh, there may be smaller agriculture plots, smaller horticulture plots, but produce was always ingrained into habitation. You never have habitation without produce. Because food is an essential commodity for habitation. Similarly, water. Planning for water, planning for food, planning for access, planning for various occupation or services. These are all part of town development, without which a habitation won't succeed. Future. Uh, so this is the uh, conceptual map that I came with to make you understand the system I was just explaining. So you see those tanks and temple and the sectors which have come in Barkur. There are 10 sectors and two extra tanks uh, for the fort and all those things. Uh, so 12 tanks, 10 sectors and different uh, areas for different occupation. Okay. Uh, and you see the north, south, east, west orientation. The reason the proof that it was designed comes from this, that it is precise north-south-east-west orientation. It's not by proof that these uh, port systems and tanks have come. It is designed. So that, that is the proof that this town was designed for habitation and not just evolved over time. Okay. Now I'll just go to one place. Like I said, the Nabi, that means what is this? thing that actually uh, represents the structure of the town. So here is the uh, temple and the tank, which I said kind of uh, is a beautiful anchor for the uh, system, where uh, the, the temple has one enclosure, which is of course the Garbagudi, then another enclosure for its various practices, the sub-gods, and one uh, well will always be there next to the temple, which is recharged by the rainwater of the temp, uh, of that area itself. So every well uh, and the surrounding is done such a way that natural rainwater recharge happens. Many of them are now uh, closing the gaps between stones with cement, which prevents the natural recharge, which is a bad practice happening in recent times. But the natural one or the old one was to have open uh, paving, like we call it where the gaps will allow the rainwater to percolate the soil and recharge the groundwater. 
and after the enclosure is another enclosure now here there are just pavilions and shaded areas remember these temples did not belong to only uh, like rituals or that god these temples were actually uh, public structures for shelter it is a go to place if you have nowhere to go most of these temples used to provide free food every afternoon for anybody who is around so you get you are assured of one meal a day if you are visiting a town without requiring any money or any uh, kind of resource uh, so you just need to go there and sit and you will be fed so these uh, temples are not just uh, places i think it's a go to place for people to seek protection if you have no where to go if you have been thrown out or you have a problem with your house you go to the temple and sleep that's a common thing like it is a go to place for everything in the society where there is a problem even psychologically you are disturbed you go to temple and sit for the calm and peace or uh, i feel we need such places in the society where the vulnerable the people who don't have any other place to go for mental peace for being abused and you want to go to place to seek shelter where you'll be safe or you're traveling and you have nowhere to go you don't know anybody where to go which is trustworthy a temple seems to be the best place to go because one is because of god normally we believe that people will fear to cheat you or commit a crime against you in that place second is no one uh, it doesn't belong to any person so no one has the right to throw you out okay and of course uh, people have the best behavior in temples no you may behave badly outside a temple but normally in a temple people will behave better so if you want to seek shelter that's the place to go so i feel this is like a go to place for all the vulnerable we talk of equity i think equity doesn't come by giving money to everybody equity comes for having a place for everybody in the town there should be a place for each and every type of person each and every type of uh, profession each and every type of uh, habitation in a town so uh, you know we have slums because we have not designed for that type of profession or that type of people in the town and that's why they become the uh, what you what you call the slums today yeah. the uh the uh, the uh, illegal uh, development but why is does not that does not happen in old towns is because there was a place for them in the town there is a place for every economic group there was a place for every type of people and there is a shelter also you don't need hundreds of shelters you need one place which is trustworthy in each sector which becomes a shelter for you where you won't be disturbed now that spirit whether it's maintained by the society or not is different but this was the concept behind the temple the especially the last layer and that's why it has plinths plinths is a place where you can sleep you can relax you can uh, you and you don't uh, have the uh, requirement to guard it because there's nothing movable uh, in fact i i really love the whole idea that furniture is a plinth rather than anything else because you don't have to guard it there is no investment from outside and there's no movable everyone can use it for free okay just outside the town uh, temple complex after the built form are spaces for different community gatherings and then comes the road and the tank now again the road and the tank also transforms into community spaces during festivals so there is a place for expansion during the festivals and then it becomes part of the town when the festival is not there a simple access route and the tank is a separate identity from the temple it is not just part of the temple it is a tank which has its own name it has its own identity and it's basically located in such a way that for that sector it harvests the rainwater so it's a water a rainwater harvesting tank if we call it in modern times but its association with temple has made it um alive for so many centuries people have not enclosed it because they are fearing the god or that at least fear of god has prevented them from removing the tank or encroaching the tank or spoiling the tank with dirt there's no garbage thrown into the tank there's no encroachment into the tank and of course if you see the expenditure of making the tank itself shows how much importance they 
gave. It's completely lined with stones. Uh, the steps are there are stones. The amount, the size is such that it's bigger than the temple complex. The amount of stone and lining and the expenditure that has gone in creating a tank may be equal or more than the uh, uh, amount they have spent on the temple. Now, that is the importance they gave to these tanks. In fact, this is the uh, big tank. There is a bigger tank, which is four times this size. So you can Im imagine the cost uh, which they spent in making these tanks and the importance they gave for it. So it is not encroached for centuries now, 12 to 21. That's 800 years. It has survived in a clean manner without trash or waste going into it. And I think that has happened because it's associated with the temple. Actually, I feel the temple was made to guard the tank. The tank was the most important thing for the people. Okay. So I, I like that uh, idea of having a social meaning given to the tank to safeguard the interest of the tank. Okay. In terms of the road, again, the road is made very uh, pervious. You have visual porosity, you have activity porosity. It's not rigid. That makes it alive. That makes it uh, giving a very human feel. And of course, uh, climatically also, people, if you want people to walk, you need to give them place to sit. Otherwise, don't call your street pedestrian. It's not just about removing the traffic from the road that makes a, a place pedestrian. Pedestrian is defined when you make it comfortable or give the facilities for the pedestrian. What does the facility a pedestrian need? Shade, uh, seating, and refreshments, and in case they can have some activity or entertainment. The visual quality, the shade quality, the, uh, the visual, uh, what you call it, uh, beauty of uh, things to see, things to do. The porosity is required. Only then you can call a street pedestrian friendly. You can't have just removing the traffic and okay, people are going to walk. That doesn't happen. So when you say pedestrian street, the porosity, the shelter, and this uh, red color which I've shown is open for all. And this feature is there in commercial shops, in uh, institutional buildings. This uh, houses also have the plinth jutting out with seating. That means the whole edge of the road, irrespective of its use, whether it's residential, it's commercial, it's institutional, will have a plinth jetting out with the roof. That means a pedestrian can anytime sit. In fact, they say in olden days, water and good, that is jaggery used to be kept uh, in this plinth area so that no one uh, feels pain because you get dehydrated. There's a hot and humid climate. Dehydration is very fast. So this wood and water would be kept uh, uh, outside uh, for the travelers to drink whoever wants to drink. So that I think is a pedestrian friendly road where you encourage people to move, to sit. And this is not in a zone which is called private. There is no restriction on privacy here. If it's a commercial, uh, they will open that side to uh, the shop and the shopping area go comes after that. It's institutional. The plinth will have two or three levels where you can sit and do the different rituals or practices. And if it's a residential, that will be a wall with the door. Uh, after this plinth, you will enter. I think it's very similar to Kotla, but here it's a little deeper because of the hot and humid. So this is a sketch I did of the road, how it changes or adapts to different features of the place. And uh, like I said, the plinth is used as a seating. The plinth is defined to give hierarchy to different uses. Uh, the plinth is used to give a kind of a uh, pathway to approach. The plinth is also there next to the water body. I think the use of plinth as many roles that it plays is beautiful in these architectures, especially for this climate. It makes a lot of sense, the veranda and the plinth, because uh, in a hot and humid climate, you need ventilation and shade. If you have shade and ventilation, you're in the most comfortable um, place to be. If you enclose a building with too much of walls, it will become very hot and you'll sweat a lot. 
uh, you need a lot of ventilation. So these kind of uh, spaces are the best for this kind of climate. So all the uh, forms of architecture. Now when I say chakra, that is the cycle. So we took a house to see how the spaces are used as a cycle and how are they distributed. Uh, so we took a simple house which is being lived in. It is a traditional house converted to modern times. It's not purely the old house, but it has a lot of elements of the old. So if you see this, uh, the uh, black circle is the time of the day and how the activity shifts to different parts of the, town, uh, of the house. And what you see is the, uh, the front part, that is the veranda with the courtyard, is occupied for most of the day activities. The semi-open spaces and open spaces are the most active, which uh, uh, are uh, used for the day activity and the night or storage or preparation activity, like kitchen preparation or something. Uh, the rooms on the south and the western side are used. So uh, the upper floor is usually for storage or sleeping of guests or uh, some kind of um, activities which is not regular or which is not used in uh, everyday cycle. So uh, this uh, type of not defining dining, living, kitchen uh, too much. Uh, kitchen, of course, was defined, but dining and living bedroom is not very clear because uh, the rooms were designed as per time of the day. So daytime rooms are semi-open or courtyards or uh, verandas and uh, semi-open spaces. And the storage room and night room sleeping areas are the semi-open spaces as well as the rooms on the southern. So, and there are rooms which hold the storage. The storage rooms were designed very well in the center of the house. It used to be cool throughout the day. So whatever you store vegetables, grains, will last longer. And of course, there were special uh, wooden cases uh, uh, defined to rice, which again preserves it well for the whole year. Like you harvest once a year, so that rice can stay for the whole year. Uh, so there were very good systems designed within the house cycle for various time of the day as per the climatic. So uh, what I did was I took one other house, which has a temple in the center. It looked quite pretty. And if you see the facade, even the first floor has nice uh, carvings of wood. And this is how it looked. They called it courthouse because I believe the person in this house used to uh, 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 have a lot of respect. I think he was a very important person who would give decisions or uh, pass justice to the people of this place and the temple was like a witness to the justice system. That's why it was called Courthouse of Parkour. Today, of course, that practice is not there, uh, but uh, it's still uh, retained in a quite nice manner. So other than documenting the house, what we did was record the temperature throughout the day. And what was interesting to find was these temperatures. I will just give you a, a rough uh, summary of this uh, readings in the veranda that is just inside the house both the sides one facing the inner courtyard and one facing the room the veranda's temperature varied between 28 to 30 degrees irrespective of time of the day and outside temperature in fact we measured it actually in uh, three seasons rainy season summer and uh, december i won't call it winter but it is the coldest for this region uh, which is 18 to 20 degrees centigrade. So uh, that uh, time also, uh, actually the uh, afternoon uh, temperature, lowest temperature is 28, 30 degrees. And in summers, it goes up to 40, uh, 38, 30, 40 degrees centigrade in afternoon. So uh, when I, uh, I'll give you an example that when the outside temperature was 30 degrees centigrade uh, Celsius, the inner temperature was 28 and the road, the tar road right in front of this uh, house was 54 degrees centigrade. That is the contribution of tar in front of your building. It increases the temperature almost by 20 degrees centigrade on the surface. And the mean temperature rises by at least 5, 6 degrees because of the reflection of the heat. And there was a metal roof right across the road which 
raised temperature to 65 actually what you see this orange yellow color images are the thermal images of these buildings okay so uh, if you see the uh, metal reading during the same time it goes to 65 degree means when 32 degrees is the mean temperature of this place metal reads as 65 tar reads as 54 the mean room temperature just inside the veranda reads as 28 and the mud walls are 32 itself same temperature as outside the wood is slightly more up to 39 40 degrees 42 degrees centigrade and the red tiles the mangalore tiles read to uh, 45 degrees centigrade but it does not transfer that heat on the inside uh the wood and the gap between the roof and the ceiling that is the double ceiling false ceiling prevents that heat from entering the house so what i'm trying to tell you here is the material makes such an impact on comfort condition it's very clear here that is one thing second very interesting thing which i found was throughout the day whether uh, the temperature was below 30 degrees and the uh, night came 18 degrees or when the temperature was Uh, 35 40 degrees sometimes in the afternoon the temperature inside was same 27 28 degrees and today even the ac people say that 23 is not necessarily the most comfortable temperature to be in it it should be as per the climate and i think the natural setting for acs in this region should be 28 degrees centigrade as comfortable temperature because i was there without fan without any kind of air condition not even a fan remember comfortably sitting in this house for all season throughout the day morning to evening and night almost 8 9 o'clock because i didn't want to disturb the people but there was absolutely no problem you didn't even need fan here to be comfortable okay so that shows this architecture is such a tune with the climatic condition including material choice the features the size of opening the distribution of built and open spaces everything in proportion in tune with the context and the climate uh my thesis was also all about talking with people and their perception about their town how much they know about their town how they feel about the town and uh, i like your know, listening to people also i just talk i listen a lot i love listening to stories i like chatting with old people especially who have long stories to tell about their experiences and i interviewed around 100 people who talked about the town and this is their perception how they looked at the town how much they knew so the thicker lines here are not with the street the thicker lines are the memories of people okay the thicker the line that means they remember that part the bigger the dots that much importance they gave in their stories uh, and uh, the edges are the way they defined one zone to the other So kind of I converted it into the five elements that is edges, streets, nodes, and uh, 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 district, but through verbal descriptions of people, like how they. I did a sketch map also, but not many were comfortable with the drawing a map. So I use sketch map combined with verbal description to develop this uh, model and hierarchy of town. and then also i used photographs like i would take random photographs of different places in the town and show them and they would uh recognize it or not recognize it some of them were just landscapes of rivers and uh, trees and they would still recognize it that means the imagery is not just about the built form the imagery is include landscape in their memory and this is something the urban designers don't pay attention to that landscape also is an important part of the imagery of a town and people remember it and identify with it so a tree is as important as a building or a tower or a facade and a river edge is as important as a road or a man made structure so uh, whenever we have imagery of a town the landscape is embedded in that imagery that's what the research also shows and let me say what they are proud of the last map which shows this blue yellow circles are the things that people treasure that they say they don't want to lose it's very much part of their stories their memories and what they uh, think is very important for the town and remember 
these are the points where the tanks work. So that's what I said. The beauty of this system is the elements or resources become part of the social structuring also. So if a tank is important as a water management system, the tank is important for the society and their uh, memories and their culture also. So that's the way the whole thing knits together, comes together. It's not separate. The society is not separate from design. The society and the culture is not separated from the concept of design. It's all embedded or ingrained together. And that's how it survives. That's how it works. Okay. So, uh, of course, defining the town, there is this north-south, east-west main junction. And like I said, that Kalchapra element is there in the center of the town. To the left of the town, the car street and the main temple is there, which also becomes the shopping street, which where all the main shops or the main institutions are there. But there are another 10 sectors for different groups of people. And uh, uh, north-south axis links this town by land to other towns. And the river used to link the town with the rest of the world. Even Romans came here. So this, this place was not just known for India. The Romans have uh, the name of Parku in their uh, inscriptions. So it was a very flourishing port town. Uh, and inland town is very important in those days because it can protect itself from invasions. So a lot of trade of Vijayanagara time from 14th to 16th century, this port was important to import gems and costly items, uh, including horses. Horses used to be very, Arab horses was a very costly commodity. So this is the a port where Arab horses and gems and precious stones were imported from because this was one of the safe uh, inland ports. Okay, so it was not easy to invade. It is seven five kilometers inside the uh, sea shore. So ships, big ships, could not enter uh, very easily, and it was well protected. That's why this was a very flourishing uh, port town. The other towns like Cochin and all were more for uh, large-scale trade like uh, grains and uh, spices and so on. This was used for precious goods and uh, high security type of trade. Okay, so uh, I asked people who are not familiar with the town at all to go through the town and draw the map of the town. Uh, that time uh, when I did the research, thankfully Google Maps was not there and Google Earth was also not there. So whatever was drawn is how they walked and felt the town. Now, what is interesting is the uh, map drawn from a first time visitor and she was a foreigner. She doesn't know the language. She doesn't know the history. She doesn't know the place at all. And she was a, uh, she came for two months to do research with me. She was from Austria. So obviously there was no way she could know anything about the town or the people and she could not communicate. That was the best thing. So what she drew came from her experience alone. What she saw and experienced. And that's the beauty of a design town. The experience that she had from the physical structure was the same as what the people said from their... Of course, it was uh, the, what people gave me was more detailed, more depth of the town. That is, at least the main structure was quite visible to her. And she understood that. And that, again, showed the tanks, showed the water body, showed the main junctions. So I think that was very beautiful in this research. This was my PhD, actually, that how much does physical feature impact the perception and cognition of the town? So first, I interviewed the residents of the town, 100 residents, and developed what they perceived as town. And then I cross-checked it with people who are not from that place. And of course, I did comparative analysis with other towns, which I'm not showing here. But basically, the idea was, how much does the physical feature contribute to your understanding of a town? And here, the design of the town did very much contribute to the structuring and understanding. And when I say design, I uh, actually mean everything. The systems, like I said, right? From uh, the physical structure, the infrastructure, the social structure, the water structure, and everything. So that was the design. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, we can go to the question now.
yeah thank you thank you so much ma'am so participants if you have any questions please uh, unmute and ask you can type it in the chat box also Uh, one thing I wanted to tell is, uh, instead of uh, going through what is heritage and what you should do, I thought I'll share the whole way one thing can be understood in its entirety in terms of different aspects. So I thought, uh, since all of you are teachers and very well read, I don't need to explain what is heritage or explain what you should do for any study, but rather share my experience and what all a heritage uh, uh, study would do to understand. So uh, I think uh, what would be nice is to give your feedback or uh, how we could uh, make it part of our system of education and share your thoughts and ideas. I would be very uh, happy to hear from you, not just questions per se. I think as for, uh, teachers themselves, I'm sure many of you have done your own set of studies. We could uh, discuss on uh, this thought of heritage and its uh, lessons and what we could do with it. Yeah. Was the... Uh, Deepika ma'am, uh, actually, uh, because uh, we keep telling to students about uh, the context study, how important it is uh, uh, when they go into the design problem. So yeah, uh, heritage, how it could be, how the context of heritage could be related to our current designs and all what you've explained. It's really uh, good. It's not about the questions. I just wanted to share this because we keep harping uh, to students actually context study, how important, how important. But they, we don't try, uh, they, don't, they do the study, but they leave it there. They don't get it uh, inculcated in the design. So that uh, insight we have uh, at least uh, definitely got from the presentation, definitely. Uh, thank you so much for that. And I request uh, participants, if you have any questions, please do. Or if you have any views on the presentation, please do put forward. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, architect Pallavi Patak here. Uh, uh, Could you switch on the video so it would be nice to see your face also, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, yeah just a minute. Hello? Yeah. Sure. We can't I'll... switch on my video. It's okay, it's okay. Just tell. It's, okay. it's not switching on. It's okay, continue. Yeah, I okay. can see you now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We can see you, you ma'am. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, going to a lecture and uh, I have also done my thesis on similar lines. It was about a heritage precinct and a heritage structure. Uh, what I think is uh, when even when we travel, uh, now we stay in urban areas, but we often do travel to um, remote areas, be it coastal areas or the um, hilly areas, we go to Himachal and such places. Uh, very often we do realize and we uh, really uh, kind of envy those people. We feel that they are staying in such beautiful places. But somehow if you talk to them, and if you hear from them, then they are uh, or kind of, you know, they are more attracted towards the uh, newer materials and technologies. And they come up with such feedbacks, you know, that uh, to aisa tha, ab to acha ho gaya, ab pakka ghar ho gaya, ab to acha ho gaya. So uh, somewhere do you think uh, that um, our research is lacking in you know, dying and um, because uh, it's easier for us maybe to say that the house is beautiful, but when it comes to the maintenance part or to the um, uh, to the drawbacks, slight drawbacks, the older technology has it. It then uh, it's not uh, right on our part to say that they should be living, continue to live in that uh, condition. So, uh, is uh, though conservation was not the point of my lecture, but I do agree on this point that you have said. But it's not true. It's the market. You see the ads. As soon as uh, cement companies came, 
they said uh, that's the strongest material, which is not true. Uh, here, laterite, granite, and mud construction are used in a combination with wood partially. So the maintenance part, what you're saying, is not as difficult uh, because I have seen concrete structures here in this climate in rainy season with the leakages and the seepages take more money for maintenance than these old structures, one. Then the maintenance of the electrical appliances because this becomes a hot box in a concrete structure, especially apartments which have done with concrete blocks. You need AC, otherwise you can't live. Whereas the maintenance cost, the energy uh, that is required for these old houses is not even one tenth of what these concrete structures need. Thirdly, the amount of space for the activities, because these are course, quite open-ended, flexible structures which have survived over centuries for different reasons, like they can be used as a history. So for different functions of the house, whether it's an event, whether it is a change in occupation, whether it's the change in family size, you don't have to make too many changes because the typology is so flexible. So if you look at the investment for interiors, investment for energy, investment of comfort, investment to maintain totally, then this is very low investment and I don't see any uh, uh, argument if you really do justice to calculating all this. Most of the times no one is calculating and demonstrating it. Like I said, I was sitting there comfortably in all seasons without a fan. Can you imagine in a hot and humid climate of 38 degrees and 78 uh, to 78 degrees humidity without a fan also to be comfortable in a modern house? Imagine the change in the energy input. Also furnitures like the plinth was there. I don't need to invest in interiors to make it usable. And since it's a plinth, I can use it to do any kind of activity. The flexibility is so much that I don't have to invest in changing furniture, uh, putting different kinds of things. Uh, so what I see is that economics also can be argued on very well with these uh, uh, traditional houses. But do we take the pain to do it, demonstrate it, and show it to the client? Because the client will do it for us. Uh, we have to do it for the client. That is one thing. Second thing is, when we talk of green rating, we talk of green building, we talk of sustainability and its practices, we talk of urban agriculture, we talk of food mile, we talk of uh, rainwater harvesting. These are all inbuilt in this system. So when we compare the energy, the local climate, the climate responsive architecture, they tick all the boxes. So what are we uh, really comparing? And if we compare it to the so-called modern typologies, which are prominent in the market, they will fail in all these boxes. They will fail to meet all the standards of sustainability that we in modern uh, sciences are promoting as the right typology. So what are we trying to promote as professionals is the decision we have to take. We can't blame the client for it. I think uh, the market trends, the way things are advertised, the way products are advertised is also uh, the reason why they have those perceptions and it is our job as professionals to educate them. It is not yeah. just left to, uh, you know, the general perception and we standing as uh, audience or uh, spectators. It is our job as professionals to educate, demonstrate and show the calculations and say what you save and what it can do. So the expenditure of 800 years of this architecture, if uh, compared to the modern architecture, it cannot survive more than 50 years. Yes. It has to be demolished. So the cost of construction and uh, the, uh, the materials cannot be recycled. So the uh, structures I'm talking about have lived for more than 300, 400 years. You think economically can a modern architecture compete with it? Economically, I'm talking. I'm not talking of anything else here. They can't. They are much more uh, cost effective, cost efficient and uh, uh, sustainable in all the parameters that today in modern uh, science we are talking about. So, sure, ma'am, I agree. Thank so you. I think it's, it's our a... job to educate. It's yes, not the yes. problem. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. So, participants, any other uh, questions or views from your side? Uh, good evening, uh, madam. I'm yes. Professor Shulinge Goda. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, first of all, I congratulate uh, 
for your presentation and uh, the insight which you have given to us. And also, as uh, uh, rightly you mentioned that the uh, the present uh, situation is like okay uh, because of the urban uh, uh, the rural is a uh, rural uh, people are always uh, attracted towards the uh, the new designs concrete structures or the uh, irrespective of the climate or the context of the kshetra what you have mentioned and the four pillars of the sustainable factors so uh, my uh, observation also is that uh, so the lack of uh, communication or the convincing factor uh, is the uh, one which uh, we have to inculcate and also strongly advocate uh, these factors that okay as you rightly mentioned that uh, the since the ages these structures have been sustained uh, all the natural forces and other uh, uh, situations, whether it's an economic or uh, whatever it is, uh, with respect to the community or the township. Uh, but uh, that is what uh, I would like to uh, suggest that, okay, we all need to uh, put down and then uh, say uh, with all these uh, innovations, whatever the new technology is, yes, uh, when the new technology comes, if it is applicable within our uh, kshetra or that uh, context uh, with the local material without any much uh, the import and other things. So that would be uh, nice and then we can always take that uh, technology or the, uh, uh, the uh, construction technology or the methodology for, the, for our own design. So that's what my view on that uh, part. So anyway, uh, thank you for your uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Shivlinge. And uh, what I would like uh, to address all the faculty here, especially since uh, they all uh, are teaching in different institutes, is that you write a lot even for general public, like you may have done studies with your students on sustainability. I'm not talking only of heritage here because what I look as heritage is not just to make it pure and conserve it as it is. It is to continue the knowledge systems as well as bring it or evolve it. I would call the word evolve more than preserve it. I would say evolve it for the modern time. So we need to transform, we need to change. I'm not saying everything has to stay as it is, as in the past, but the knowledge system, the appropriateness of certain things which was done before should continue even in modern times. Now, I'm not saying that the wood should be carved with a certain aesthetics only. You can change the aesthetics as per your liking, uh, as per the, uh, and use modern materials which is appropriate in a right way. There's nothing wrong uh, in doing it, but is it in tune with the context is only thing that we need to ensure. And I would say write in the newspapers, publish your uh, findings in article journals because magazines are not just uh, bought by architects, uh, but also by lay people who are planning to maybe uh, demolish their houses or change drastically the type of uh, places that they live in or construct. So if you can write in these different forums which reaches out to the general public, you'll be not only educating your students but also educating the general public. So I always feel that architects, especially uh, academicians, uh, should write uh, more, especially for lay, me lay people because they need to know what is good, what is bad, what is a bad design, what it's going to cost them when they do bad decisions in the design process. Uh, so, and of course, all of you must have done a lot of uh, research and studies uh, yourself, as well as with your students. You can put the uh, things in layman's language and uh, publish it. I think that would be a great contribution as a, a set of professionals here. Uh, who are uh, doing a good job, but no one knows about it. Like I'm sure uh, the way I shared it today, a lot of good things that you all have done, but there is no, no one really looking or hearing us. 
So that's the sad part. Uh, and I feel you should uh, be writing about it. Then the problem which ma'am said uh, that, uh, you know, lay people don't understand the, the importance or the beauty of old architecture. They don't want to maintain it. All these problems will go once we educate uh, people uh, through our writings, through our talks, uh, through to lay people, uh, non-professionals, that is not architects alone, others also. So I think that would be very nice. Thank you so much, ma'am. Is there uh, anything you want to share uh, as a future uh, suggestions on this topic? I think we all are uh, teachers. In fact, my professor used to say teachers are the best students because they pay attention, uh, they want to learn, and they're the most responsive crowd. So I hope I'm addressing uh, people who are all, uh, excited to learn, like uh, even me. Uh, so I would surely like to hear certain suggestions or ideas that you would like to share. Or maybe in the chat box I've shared. Uh, uh, one more thing, I shared my research gate profile because all the research that I have done in case you want to uh, see it more or read more about it, you can uh, go to my research gate profile and download all my work. So I've shared my thesis, my presentations, my talk, my technical reports on uh, different aspects that I've worked with. So anyone who wants to have access to my research, free of course, they can, uh, uh, go to my profile in research gate and uh, download it. So uh, that was another thing I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that Re uh, research gate profile you told, ma'am. Yeah, I think in my last slide I had just put it. Yeah. You just type research gate and my name, sure. it will come. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That will be really helpful uh, for us to go through all your research work and other details. Okay, I think any, I think any people are tired end of the day. <laughs> any other questions from participants? Now, uh, another one uh, uh, thing I would like to ask you, madam, is the regarding the sustainability factor in our design, the capacity of the place or the uh, so the because uh, today we are running out of all the natural resources and regarding that the uh, the place should have a natural uh, always have its own natural capacity and then we are not uh, looking at that perspective and then we are designing and then uh, expanding the thing and then we are uh, finally lead that to uh, the filthy or the uh, environment or we are not able to, or it is not going to sustain itself. So that's going to be the uh, situation. What is your uh, view on that? No, absolutely, but uh, that comes in the aspect of planning because carrying capacity is the way we define density of the population and land use development. So actually today no one's uh, defining the carrying capacity and uh, the, the rules and regulations for development plans are not good enough. They don't even do the contour maps before designing the roads and there is no water management system for the town. Like I said, the ancient town of Barkur had water management system sectors and everything inbuilt in town planning, which should be there. Like you said, carrying capacity is developed through resource management. And that's why in planning we define density uh, the uh, upper limit of density, the infrastructure is as per that density. So when they do next five year planning, they just increase the density without assuring that the carry, uh, the resource management is appropriate or not, whether water management is appropriate or not. And uh, they easily pump water from rivers and all that, which is not the right way of design. Uh, so uh, it has become very, uh, in fact, uh, recently, uh, I, I don't know if I should put it on record, but I feel today uh, the decisions of town uh, and the management of town has become more of a political issue than a professional issue. Um, 
sorry to say i was stunned with the choice of land for a new capital of amravati which is a black cotton soil in a flood plain which is uh, uh, uh you know rice bowl of india so you're removing a uh, fertile soil which has lot of uh, per uh, cent output of uh, agriculture which is flooding area next to the river which is black cotton soil inappropriate for construction so the cost of construction per square meter is tenfold than a normal uh, site is being used to define a capital town for hectares and it will keep growing so how is that decision professionally appropriate as professionals who we all understand land we all understand the cost of construction we all understand uh, uh, flooding uh, how can we professionally justify the cho choice of land for a new capital town but it's all happened because of the political motivation so when decisions of our profession are being taken by people which are not in the profession or not professionally verified i don't think we can solve these problems uh, only when these decisions are professionally decided like what is the carrying capacity what is the density where should the town develop how should the town develop if it is left to the professionals i think we will be more uh, justified yeah uh, very well said madam actually so it's many it's not a professional <laughs> decision so uh, carrying capacity doesn't come into the picture it's a political decision yeah uh, i do agree that uh, with the situation uh, what we are and uh, most of our uh, research papers and uh, the outcomings of those papers and the in you know, uh, whatever the recommendations to the policy makers uh, they are not going to look at it and even if they go through that uh, there are certain uh, vested interests and then exactly we are going through exactly. that exactly it's it's not in our profession so whether i comment or you comment doesn't come into picture uh, it, i mean no professional is involved in those decisions that's why i meant it is not a professional decision it's a political decision so if it was left to the professionals it would have more logic and more justification now we talking about it knowing it is wrong uh, has no impact on what is happening on the ground so now is it a collective responsibility to represent ourselves as a academia or the uh, i think uh, you know yeah. I, i think we made a lot of un cry for central vista rather than amravati look at it yeah. what did yes. our profession do what did we do we made so much of hangama which is again politically motivated on central vista which is already a developed land for me as a person who looks at environment sustainability heritage i felt there were many big issues in amravati and other uh, threatened areas of our cities which flooding is happening random development is happening none of us took those pauses but we were more focused all over india on central vista in every classroom in every institute in every forums we were discussing it. so i'm not saying discussing central vista is wrong i'm saying how much importance the relative importance we gave as a professional to different issues which should concern us is not a, uh, in proportion to the issue itself it's more politically motivated so that's also there within us so kindly uh -huh. understand uh, the problem we are not uh, uh, talking uh, i mean i talk this way wherever i am that's why i am not very popular in any forum because i don't belong to any group uh, i don't belong to any kind of political or uh, uh, you know professional group i have kept myself neutral uh, all these years 22 23 years because i want to focus on the issue i want to focus on my subject i want to be an academician hardcore and i want to stick to the rules of the profession uh, so i will talk like this irrespective of whom it hurts or whom it hits no, it is it is required today's scenario situation i think uh, if the voices are more in all the from all the corners i think uh, uh, things may change that's what uh, uh, we hope yeah, that I, i think all of us in our own region have lot of issues to fight for as professionals yes. and we should raise our voices to it if, including central west i'm not saying it's not an issue but i'm saying there are so many issues we had to talk about which we are not doing but, and uh, according but, to me amravati is such a bad uh, decision which 
all of us as professionals, including planners, should have objected to, uh, uh, and we not even raised a single voice against it. Uh, that that's surprising for me. That's very surprising because each of us knows that it is wrong. There is also a history of catastrophe in that particular region. No, uh, I mean, you asked the presentations of people who worked on that project. The cost of managing the flood itself is going beyond budget. Just forget construction. The cost of construction is 40, 50 times of that of a normal land. So why are we, and of course, it's taking away the land from agriculture, which is part of food security of the country. It's a food bowl, a rice bowl of India. It's not just for the state of uh, that place. So we are taking away land, which is providing food for the country and future population is going to increase. And we are reducing the most fertile land of our country for agriculture. Secondly, the cost of construction is 40 to 50 times of the normal land. Thirdly, the, it's a flooding plain. And that's why it was good for agriculture, that is rice. So we are constructing, which is prone to flood. That means every year there's going to be a disaster irrespective of how we build it. And uh, managing it has become a challenge for professionals. So one dis wrong decision has a cascading effect to everything, right? From infrastructure to the cost. So first we take the wrong site and then we're trying to mitigate it with all kinds of uh, technology is not the right way of doing design. Choose a site which is appropriate and then think of making it the best capital city in the world. But when your site is wrong, no matter how much you spend and what you do in design, it's not going to make it right. And that's why I said the context is, and they said they have designed as per Vastu. I think the first rule of Vastu is soil. And it says certain soils are not appropriate for construction. They neglected the first rule of Vastu. We curse Vastu so much, but actually, if we go into the science of it, there's so much to learn. And the first rule of Vastu is test the soil and its appropriateness for construction. And that's the first rule they neglected while choosing Amravati. Now, how much are we worried about it? Yes, yes. And then in our uh, Bangalore context, uh, uh, today we are all going with uh, this one, uh, the constructing the RCC drains instead of uh, the natural exactly. sway. So that is, it's again, uh, stormwater drains of RCC is not a solution. You should yeah. allow recharge, you should allow time. percolation. So all such wrong things happening. How much are we writing against it in the newspaper? How much are we protesting against it in the public forums? How much are we discussing it in our studios? How much are we educating the people about it, the lay people about it? That is also our job as professionals. How yeah. much are we talking about it? Yes, true, madam. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that uh, topic. But uh, uh, I think as professionals, as academicians, we don't belong to any, uh, you know, vested interest. We don't have any commercial agenda. Uh, I think we should be uh, looking at the profession and the ethics of the profession very strongly. We are building values to the profession. I think all as a group of teachers, we bring value education also into the profession. So uh, what is ethics in the profession? We should bring it into the academics. Yes, madam. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you so much, ma'am. I think uh, no more questions are there from the participants. So we'll just wind up the session. Yeah, thank so, you. Uh, yeah. On behalf of uh, School of Architecture, the Anand Sagar Academy of Technology and Management, I, Architect Anushruti, take this opportunity to convey vote of thanks to our uh, today's session two speaker, uh, Dr. Deepika Shetty, ma'am. So thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and took out time from your busy schedule for us. So I really appreciate your effort for enlightening us uh, about the different aspect of uh, heritage and its importance and uh, retaining its identity in architecture. And that is especially for our future generation, that is definitely this heritage is our uh, legacy from the past and we have to pass it to the future generation. Uh, so definitely that was a very interesting session. And uh, once again, thank you, ma'am, for your uh, valuable time and uh, your valuable thought. Uh, so thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you for the invitation and a chance to meet our colleagues as part of FTP. 
And you. Uh, you can always write to me on my email ID and you can access my research on research. Sure, sure. Definitely, ma'am. Definitely. Yeah, it will be really helpful for all of us uh, if we go through your research paper. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you all the participants uh, to actively 